everyone. Welcome to episode 215 of At Odds with Wrestling. I almost screwed that up as well. Joe and Adam here. Adam, hello. How are you? I'm doing fine, Joe. You gave us like an extra 700 episodes. I was thinking like, man, where have I been? I was reading the time code as opposed to the episode number. Ah, I see. All right. Yeah. Sometimes I get confused. I'm an old man. No, I got you. Well, at least you're an old man that I don't fight in a parking lot, you know? Yeah. So, hey, uh, so, you know, obviously, we, I'm, I'll let's just say I'm going to save any sort of Twitter discussion for maybe later on in the show when the voicemail comes up. Okay. Uh, but I missed them when they initially rolled out about you getting into a kerfuffle uh, with an old man. What was it? At the uh, Strouds, the Stroud Mall or what? What was it? <laughs> no, it was uh, Tonkanic Walmart. Tonkanic Walmart. <laughs> As I've been known to be at, you know? <laughs> so. Oh, listen, you're on a dull safari. I get it. Um, yeah, it's just like, um, I don't even get into that with people, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't get out much, so it's not like people are in my face about it in person. Uh, but at my super secret science job, I get to hear it a lot, you know? Yeah, you Um, know what the reason is, is for, like, years at the importer-exporter business, I had to deal with it and just eat it. You know, you'd have people that would be like, how much is this phone? Oh, it's $1,000. $1,000? Oh, fucking, fucking Obama. Fucking <laughs> driving the prices of things up. And then you're just like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But now I'm at the point where I'm just like, there's no chains on me. So if somebody gives me shit like that, I just snap. <laughs> you know? the, the, close, the closest I come is when my dad says stuff like that like he doesn't go too far but like he'll say stuff that's like patently false yeah and i'll just be like very matter of factly be like that's not true and like i'm not like opening the conversation to debate whatever he's bringing up you know yeah you're just putting it you're stamping it out trying yeah like he's been telling me and my wife for like the last five weeks that we better do our christmas shopping now because of Biden, they're closing the supply chains and all the trains are going to stop running. <laughs> and I said to him, I go, that's not true. And yeah. then he get, then like he brings it up every week and every week I just say, that's not true. And then I move on. I change the, the change the subject. But um, yeah, so a stranger. But kudos to you, you know, uh, well, being thanks. so brazen. <laughs> like I said, I'm not going to back down from any elderly person. I'll fight them all. I don't care. Right. The infirm children, I don't care. Step up to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, luckily, nothing like that happened to me when I went to go see uh, AEW Rampage this past week. Ooh, nice segue. I like it. Yeah, it was sad to see like a, a, a three-fourths closed down Atlantic City boardwalk, you know, because one, the pandemic, and two, it was November. Yeah, I mean, you got to see it, though, in the summertime. Everything's open, Joe. It's definitely not a dying city. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, you know, we went there on vacation a couple years back, but it was like maybe like six years ago, you know? Yeah. And I recognized a lot of places and a lot of places that were no longer there or whatever. Uh, But it was it was it was a good show. It was a lot of um, a lot of uh, AEW dark taping stuff. It's a lot of AEW dark dark taping stuff from, as is my understanding, uh, isn't going to air for a while. They're, like, very far ahead on dark tapings for some reason. Gosh, Dan, I mean, none of that stuff further storylines anyways. It's just usually squash matches, right? Well, so, yeah, so you say that, right? And I did, and I will say I did miss a little bit of the taping only because, like, you know, I was talking to people that were there, right? Yeah. Uh, it was nice to run into some folks that I haven't seen either since the last taping or in quite some time. Um, but the main event of Dark, I don't know if you saw any of the spoilers and stuff, but the main event of Dark was uh, Garcia and 2.0 against Moxley, Claudio, and Wheeler. Oh, no, I didn't see that. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's pretty and cool. I was told, I'm like, oh, that'll probably air this week because that's like a marquee match. And then it didn't air this week, and I'm like, okay, I'm scratching my chin here thinking, I'm like, I was told they have stuff, like they were, like what they had recorded the week before, they were doing post-Thanksgiving commentary on. Okay. 
And then what they were filming here was probably going to air after that. And then Moxley came out for that with the belt. And I'm like, is that a spoiler for the pay-per-view? I don't know. Mm. Okay. They're going to yeah, superimpose good. Christmas hats on everybody, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so the, it, you know, it was a, it was a, a. Then Rampage itself was good. You know, Rampage. They're still. It's been almost a year, and they're still trying to work the kinks out of it. That like it main of it opens with OC versus Shibata, and then main events with Ward Joe versus the Authors of Pain or whatever the hell their name is. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. for NXT Tag Team Champions, the Authors of Pain. Yeah, but uh, but. It was a fun time. Lots of familiar faces in the crowd since we were in the friends and family section, you know? Yeah, and you got to see Mike Tyson in person. How about that? From a distance, yes. (laughs) Would you get your Mark picture of Mike Tyson if you had the opportunity? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, and I will say, he wasn't on the show, uh, but coming into the building, we did see W. Morrissey outside ripping heaters, so... (laughs) All of us giants do that, you know, yes. e giant W Morrissey, me, you know, we want to stunt our growth because otherwise we would just get out of hand. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, and I have to go back and watch it. Um, but that Stokely promo that aired on dynamite this week, and that might come up later. I think that was filmed at the, uh, show on Friday. Okay. Yeah. Cause, Cause like I'm, we, wherever we were, he, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna say we were there in the daytime, and then obviously by the time we come out, uh, it was it was dark and it was like dif- differently lit, but it definitely looked like very familiar from where we were just this past Friday. Yeah, and I was gonna say like wherever he was filming it, it looked like it was a nice place, but there was no people. So mm-hmm. I was like, okay, that could be Atlantic City, you know, yeah. completely devoid of human life. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, but I have a feeling we'll be talking about more of this stuff a little bit later on. But I just wanted to kind of burn that out. I'm sure you didn't even watch Rampage this week. I, I Of course I watched it. I had to see you. You know, I, I'm a longtime fan of Katsuyori Shibata, you know, mm-hmm. and he was facing a guy that I've just recently started to like in Orange Cassidy. I watched that, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, I watched uh, I watched that. I, wa- I don't watch Rampage live. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've for the last, I mean, for the longest time, I try to watch Dynamite live or at least like 15 minutes behind. Rampage, I'll get to, you know, at some point before we record the podcast. Right. But anyways. Anyway, enough about like recent history. We'll get more into that. But let's get into like history history. huh? Yeah, let's do it. And now, At Odds with Wrestling presents This Day in Wrestling History. So, this day in wrestling history, 29 years ago, World Championship Wrestling held Clash of the Champions 25. A rather ho-hum, nothing happening show. Uh, however, the main event of that Clash of the Champions was Ric Flair taking on, at the time, World Champion uh, Vader, and uh, Flair winning by disqualification. Oh, this, well, this would set up um, Starcade '93, which I don't think we're going to get to. Just the way that like the days work, which was Flair versus Vader, and where Flair wins the belt, and it was it was promoted as Flair's career versus Vader's title. Again, it's 1993, <laughs> and they were already pushing that Ric Flair was like on his last legs then. You know? <laughs> yeah. Who knew that in 2022 he'd be one of the top guys? You know? <laughs> one day he was the top guy yeah um but th- the interesting about all this is this was a hot shot angle um you have to remember this was the time where they would do their live shows and we've talked about it a bunch of times uh during the course of you know adults with wrestling this day in wrestling history 1993 for wcw specifically where they would do those worldwide tapings and like gang tape like two months worth of tv right Mm-hmm. and they would film something like a lot of times it would happen with like maybe the TV title, but a lot of times the tag team titles were in the same taping. You know, the current champions would be, let's say the Hollywood blondes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And at that TV taping, they would film vignettes of not only the nasty boys having the titles, but also like Paul Roman, Arn Anderson, right. 
yeah, so, choose your own adventure so they can plug them in later. Right. And then, but the problem is, is you get all this stuff in the can and like, okay, well, we're going to start airing this, this stuff after this certain day, after this clash of champions, we need to make sure that title change happens. And they kind of bit themselves in the foot where like Pillman got injured and they had to randomly throw like Steven Regal into the Hollywood blondes so that <laughs> they can have them lose the belts and them to Arn and Paul Roma so Arn and Paul Roma could get them to the Nasty Boys and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So this set of worldwide tapings for the last half of 1993 was the babyface turn and world title win for Sid Vicious. Okay, and that never happens, right? Well, that never happens because about two weeks prior to this uh, overseas on a UK tour is when Arn Anderson and Sid Vicious get into a fight and uh, Arn... They scissor me. <laughs> yes. The original instance of someone saying, scissor me, daddy Sid, uh, <laughs> happened here. So, obviously, they get into a bloody fight. Weapons are used. It happens overseas. And they're like, what are we going to do? We have all this footage in the can of Sid turning babyface and being the world champion. Um, <laughs> so they just quick, like, Threw together like, how about Ric Flair? You know? Yeah. So they have footage of Sid as champion, but not him winning it, right? Right. Okay. Because they're filming two months worth of TV or three months worth of TV or whatever it was. So like, you have a bunch of interviews where he comes out talking about the upcoming match at Starcade, and then you have things that air after Starcade where he comes out with the belt. Gotcha. Okay. Now yeah, I. I guess like, I was just going to say, I can see it. That's just such a colossal pain in the ass. I get that you're you're saving money and whatever, but run some house shows or something. You know? <laughs> it would almost be like, okay, and it would almost be like running weeks and weeks of dark tapings where you're three, <laughs> month, or three weeks ahead of schedule, and then you have a match where the champion comes out, and then it doesn't air, whatever. Um, <laughs> and then maybe it spoils the results of a pay-per-view because he comes out with the belt still, you know? Yeah. Oh. Uh, they would, a, a, a second wrestling company wouldn't do that again, would they? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, so the other thing in this day in wrestling history, of course we do 1997. And not to say that this day in wrestling history, 1997 was not a noteworthy day. Um, you know, it's our head to head raw and nitro. Uh, but the day before 25 years ago was arguably the most eventful day in wrestling history because it was the Montreal screw job. Look at you playing fast and loose with the uh <laughs> with the this day in history stuff. Well, no, I have to mention the Montreal screw job because both Raw and Nitro are fallout from the Montreal screw job, right? Yeah. No, I get so, you. So Nitro starts off with the entire NWO in the ring. They sing Oh Canada. <laughs> um, they essentially just say like Bret Hart's coming in he's going to be in the NWO Bischoff makes the remark that he hears that Bret is a real knockout kind of guy <laughs> and obviously so much of this like we would not learn for like if you were a newsletter right, a newsletter subscriber maybe like a week later but like a lot of people didn't know any of this until Wrestling with Shadows comes out like almost a year later right so yeah, Bishop, he, on TV, Bishop on TV saying Brett's a real knockout kind of guy. It's like, what the hell is he talking about, you know? Yeah, and the show went off the air before he was, like, blowing up the monitors and, like, doing the WCW pantomime with his fingers, right? Yeah. Gotcha. So, like, there, were, there was internet in 1997, but it wasn't, like, what it is today where you're getting immediate reactions and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. But other than that, you know, th we get that whole thing on Nitro where, like, Bret Hart's coming in. He's part of the NWO. Um, Eddie Guerrero ends up beating Rey Mysterio for the Juicer Weight title <laughs> uh, on this episode of Nitro. And the flock is getting bigger as uh, newly debuting in the flock is the former Van Hammer, who's now just Hammer. Yeah. Okay. He looked cool as shit back then. I liked Van Hammer then. <laughs> 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 with his with his nipple rings and mesh t-shirt and yeah. Stevie Nicks hair in 1997, sure. <laughs> yeah, that was cool for 1997. Mm -hmm. uh, so Raw, on the other hand, of course, they're still in Canada. They're in Ottawa, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the show starts off, and this is, you know, they were doing live. You know, there was a couple times where we talked about taped and stuff. 
and this will be a teaser for next week's This Day in Wrestling History, of course. Um, you know, they, they do the live Raw, and then they do a taped Raw for next week. The show starts off with Rick Rude introducing uh, Shawn Michaels as the WF champion. This is the debut of the DX music. Okay. This is the first time that they ever play the DX music, and the infamous DX Titantron video makes its debut on this Raw. Okay, historic. I like it. it right. Um, Sean comes down and runs down Brett, says that he sent him down south with the rest of the fossils. <laughs> uh, no Vince on commentary, of course. Uh, the previous Raw was the last time that Vince would be on commentary as a regular commentator. Uh, JR is very, like, somber and morose that Brett is gone and, like, says, you know, we tried to make it work out, but we wish him well, you know? Uh-huh. Um, we also get the, f- like, so this Raw begins the build for what would end up being the first Stone Cold versus The Rock match at In Your House Degeneration X pay-per-view. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna get, like, the bit coming up, like, we're gonna get, like, this whole feud but, like, this Raw was the first ever Rock Austin, like, promo back and forth. Okay. You know? And, and wasn't there, I, I saw on Twitter uh, that there was the uh, Jeff Jarrett, like, interview with JR. Was that on this Raw? Yeah. So they, you know, obviously there was a sit down interview with Double J. It was supposed to be like the Gold Dust one and the Mankind ones from previous in the year. And there was, this was part two of the Double J one. It was supposed to air the week before for some reason gets bumped to this week and they didn't like fix it or edit it. And like so much of the interview with double J was about like Bret Hart, Bret Hart, Bret Hart. I'm going to beat Bret Hart for the world title. My thing is to become the WF champion. You know, I've never beaten Bret, 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 Bret. (laughs) And it's like, we could have fixed this in post guys. You know, I know you only had a day, but you already held the thing off a week. You could have done it a little bit, you know, whatever. Um, that being said, as a Double J fan, this was not the Double... Like, I like Double J. I was always a fan. But this was not the Double J that I love. And maybe more on that later. <laughs> All right, I was going to say, oh, well, we've we've met the Double J quota of the show. and But no, we're going to exceed it, I guess. No. And and this episode of Raw is also one of the 19 different signposts that everyone points to. It's like, oh, this is the official beginning of the Attitude Era. Oh, this is the official beginning. But it's a two-hour Raw uh, there's seven matches, four of which end either in disqualifications or no contests. Hmm. Um, you know, again, you get Rock and Austin first time. You get the DX music and Titan Tron. So, you know, you can make a real and no more Brett. Um, you can really make the uh, argument that this like the, if if all these other things were like the pieces of the Attitude Era, this is like the Attitude Era begins. Like now Brett's gone and we could just do whatever the fuck we want, you know? Yeah, and people are saying that the Outlaws versus uh, the the Bre- the Blackjacks or whatever was the first handicap match or not handicap uh, uh, core match. And, uh, uh, technically, you could say that you know they they called it a bunkhouse brawl. Okay, and um, I, what I was going to get is like you might have lost Bret Hart, but you have somebody who's better than Bret Hart in Jesse James. Oh yes, at least in his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize it was a handicap match as I read the notes here. It was just Brad Shaw. My my apologies. Right. And so this was the other thing. So like a lot of people are missing from this show. Um, you know, uh, Crush, I know Big Loss, Mankind <laughs> isn't there. Um, you know, Wyndham isn't there. A lot of people aren't there. A lot of people stayed home in protest of what happened to Brett the night before. Hmm. OK, and. You know, I, I feel as though, like, uh, even if you're a relatively new fan, if you're, you've are you been a lapsed fan that you've kind of come and gone as things have been whatever, I think a lot of people know a lot about the Montreal Screwjob and stuff. But, like, there's so much to it other than just what happened to the ring. And, like, we don't have the time to do that. I will give them a plug, not that they need it. Uh, but Chris Zellner, David Bixen Span, Between the Sheets, their Patreon, $5 a month. Um, they do a monthly show, deep dive. Sometimes it's like two, three, even four episodes that are multiple hours plus, And they just started doing all the Montreal screw job stuff. And like they get into 
all the newsletters. They get like newspaper articles. They get legitimate news interviews, and they really break it down to like see that this started like back in September to get us to this point. You know? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Check it out. Yeah. I I love wrestling history stuff. So you know that's it's that is my wheelhouse, and that's why this segment exists on our show. You know. Mm-hmm. And plus, without this, how would I ever learn any of this? Right. Right. You know? Exactly. <laughs> So let's talk about uh, the rest of the week in wrestling. Where would you like to begin, sir? You know what? Since you talked about doing a go to wrestling earlier in the show, uh, let's just follow up there. Uh, we had a soon to be named Network Boys Night Out on Monday. Yes. And uh, you, me, Brett, and DJ from We Need Wrestling all went to attend a little upstart indie that was running in our area called WWE Monday Night Raw. Yeah. World Wrestling Entertainments, yes. Oh, yes, the World Wrestling Entertainment. Uh, I went because now that Papa H is in charge, uh, it's a great company, so I, I want to watch it live. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, uh, you were nice enough to invite us, and uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, for like a split second, I was like, no, I don't want to go to Raw. But then I thought to myself, number one, I've never been to a Monday Night Raw. I've been to... Uh, you know, a SmackDown at that arena and a WCW show back in the day. And I thought to myself, I've never been to a Raw, so why not do it, you know, for the first time? And then I thought to myself, hey, I might get to see the head of the uh, the head of the table, you know, Roman Reigns. And then I thought to myself, forget Roman Reigns. I might to be in this, get to be in the same building as Alexa Bliss. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when I had that realization, I was like, hell yeah, I'll go. And obviously, you know, you'll tell your part of it, but uh, we had great seats, second row, uh, facing the ring from the hard cam side. And you know what? Like I said, I I just feel like I haven't been to a taping in so long that, like, what tapings were, you know, they have completely changed. Like, the fact that, like, when they go to commercial, if they're not wrestling, like, the lights go out. The lights go out. The lights go out. You know, just to let people know they're off the air. And, like, just the following the action during the match when they go to commercial and, like, just seeing that, like, all right, now we're doing rest holds. We're we're playing with the crowd instead of doing spots. You know, the commentators aren't talking anymore. Uh, It was just interesting to see that stuff. And I know that for most people, like, big deal. But, again, I just haven't – I haven't been to a live taping in so long that it was just a unique perspective, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm shocked that you've never been to a Raw, like, especially during the Attitude Era. I just take it for granted, you know, like... Well, they never did a Raw in this area, you know? Well, that you know, that, right, so, okay, so our area, but, like, I would drive to, like, Philly, Virginia, Binghamton, yeah, you know, no, like, I'd I drive, like, six-plus hours away, you know, to go to see Raw, you know? I would love WWE. No, I grew up a poor. I couldn't do that. I <laughs> best I could do would be like Jim Thorpe or Allentown for ECW. And you, then know? It's, you know, okay, all right, all right. But yeah, so I just I, I would have loved to go to a Raw back in the day, but you know, just never did it. Just like I never got to go to the ECW arena. Big regrets, but yeah. Uh, as far as the show itself, you know. Uh, a lot of criticism about the Wilkes Bear crowd not being the best crowd. Well, oh my God, g- give us something to react to, and maybe we will. Uh, but I will say, you know, as far as looking back at this day twenty years from now, you know, we'll get to say where were you the night that Dan Brooke lost the twenty four seven title, <laughs> and they retired the twenty four seven title exactly, and Nikki Cross almost got it in the garbage, so that was a thing. And, uh, you know, Austin Theory failed to cash in his money in the bank against Seth Rollins, which was you- interesting. I know that a lot of people on the Internet are mad about that. Um, but I will just say, and then I'll throw it over to you. Uh, I thought in person, Judgment Day's entrance was cool as shit. Bobby Lashley's entrance was cool as shit. Just like the, the presentation with the lights and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Joe, I was like eight feet away from Alexa Bliss. Like, <laughs> seriously (laughs) like come on like that was the only thing that could have made me happier is if she got actually like a longer like a match yeah Uh, but maybe next time like (laughs) maybe i'll go next time they're at the arena uh i was a i was a very happy boy like i'm i'm shocked that like 
Brett didn't get a picture of my me with just my jaw on the ground like the whole time. Well, you know, obviously we'll work backwards from what you had mentioned. So uh, they do a gimmick, and Adam pointed this out to us. Like, I haven't been to WWE TV since, like, whatever that NXT Royal Rumble in Philly was that had Gargano versus Andrade on the NXT, and it was the Rumbles where Asuka and Nakamura won. Okay. Okay, so that's, like, the last time I was at, like, WWE TV, however long ago that was. I haven't been to, like, a Raw, whatever, and forever before that. Um, so we go to the merch thing, and we got tipped off ahead of time on a specific piece of merch that was for sale there. <laughs> and we're in line, and we're like, oh, we're in line. And Adam's like, oh, they have these QR code gimmicks, right? Just scan it and whatever, right? So we all, me, Brett, DJ, and they'll tell the story on We Need Wrestling, I'm sure. So we all scan our things, and we all order the same shirt that sells Wilkes Bear with a Wilkes Bear E. Wilkes Barry, like Gay Perry, but Wilkes Barry with an accent over the last E in Wilkes Bear, three sixteen. Right, uh, a friend of mine wanted me to pick it up for them, so I did. I'm like, I don't need it, you know. But Brett and DJ got theirs, and I think DJ wore his to the comic shop this week, you know. Yeah. Um. So we do our scan thing, and they're like, Oh, you can go pick it up down in section like one nineteen or whatever, right? So I'm like, Okay, we'll get it later. I'm watching Raw, and they're like, coming up next is Otis versus Elias. And I'm like, <laughs> you guys want to go? You guys want to go get our shit now? All right, let's go get it now. Beat the rush. So we go up, uh, and we get our stuff real quick, real easy. The guy just looks at our numbers. Here's your things. Get going. Um, and then, of course, we run into some other people. Um, and again, I'll just, you know, and listen, I'm not one to brag, but I will throw a gentle ribbing in and say that my comp seats were better than Jerry of Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium. <laughs> and they're, w- and it wasn't this event, but they're way better than Big Moose Cooches, who goes online and brags that her and Liv Morgan are best friends. She gets nosebleed seats and claims that it was last minute. It was less than 24 hours between the time that I had my tickets offered to me and I got them. We had second row, baby. Yeah. Just saying. (laughs) I think Big Moose Cooch might be a liar. Anyway. (laughs) Uh, So we run into Jerry. We run into a couple other people there. We're chit-chatting, whatever. And uh, there was like a little family next to us, like a little girl and a little boy. And I come back and the little girl says, before we get to your thing, the little girl says to me, he's like, she goes, where were you guys? You missed three rounds. Okay, three rounds? That's what oh. she said. She, we missed three rounds. Of okay. Wrestling, I guess. I don't know. You just a little kid. You didn't know any better. <laughs> so we're, yeah. we're, we're coming down, and we see that it's like uh, the Asuka, Bianca, uh, Ale- Bianca, uh, Asuka, and Alexa group coming out, you know? Yeah. And we're coming back to our seats, and I hold back, and I'm like, let Adam have this moment to himself. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to be like, you know, excuse us, excuse us, getting back to our seats, right? Because, like, mm-hmm. as we were coming down and we were getting ready to come back to our seats, like, they were all doing their pose to hard cam. And that's where we were, right? So Adam's there in his glory, taking pictures, big grin on his face, right? Um, But you mentioned, uh, of course, like, oh, give us something to cheer, right? Um, yeah. I, I will say, for the most part, that was a hot crowd there in Wilkes-Bear. And oh, absolutely. Everybody online was burying Wilkes-Bear for how, how you know, poor they were as a crowd. Now, listen, I will say, if you're just an Monday Night Raw list, watch listener, and, like, they throw a Cedric Alexander match out there. And, no, and again, no, no offense, no disrespect to Cedric Alexander. I think Cedric Alexander's great. You throw Shelton Benjamin out there in a match. Again, no disrespect to Shelton Benjamin, but these are two guys that have not been on Raw in, like, forever, right? Mm-hmm. So you throw them out there, and, like, people, they're essentially cold matches, right? So the crowd's not going to be into them. Crowd's super into the opening segment with the, the Usos and Solo Sokoa, and then the New Day coming out, and then Riddle coming out. I think I think Riddle's parents were in front of us, just so you know. Oh, that's who the, the, they were, or he was interacting with a bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so like the crowd's super into that, the Miz and Johnny Gargano stuff, whatever your opinion of like the pre-match, the, the pre-match skit and the match itself, crowd's super into it. Seth comes out for his promo and then the stuff with, uh, Judgment Day and the Bullet Club and everything else, this crowd's super into it. Crowd's going nuts for stuff. They're doing the sing-along with Seth. Like every time he stops talking, they're doing the stupid sing-along with his music. And I'm not saying like 
Like, I'm saying, like, 70% of the arena, 75% of the arena. So the fact that it was mic'd so poorly and came across so bad on TV bums me out so much. You know, um, I- I'm a homer for where I live. You know, I don't, I like, I'm not like Wilkes Bear Pride and I wear like Wilkes Bear shirts and stuff. <laughs> but when it comes to wrestling, like, Wilkes Bear's a good town, man. Like, Wilkes Bear's a hot crowd, a hot town. They still think ECW is real shoot fighting, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, AEW at the Kingston Armory, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, tell Double J, you know? Um, but yeah, it just bummed me out that it was mic'd so poorly. And, you know, we got two dark matches, uh, Zylon Quinn and Tozawa and Wendy Chu and uh, Tamina. Those are going to be matches on main event. I have no idea when main event airs, um, but I was happy to see Wendy Chu get, like, the look on a, on a main event match, whatever. I don't think Tamina was the right opponent for her. Uh, mm-hmm. But, like, even the crowd was, like, super into, like, Tozawa's goofing around comedy spots, right? Yeah. And, like, they were biting on his fucking near falls and stuff. And, like, no offense to Tozawa, but it was Tozawa. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. well, I don't think Wilkes Bear is a big main event crowd, but, like, they were into shit, man. And it just bums me out that, like, we have this bad reputation online. Well, uh, the people that voice that, I mean, once they get their blue check mark, you know, they'll be out of our lives. <laughs> More on that later, I guess. All right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what? I had a good time. Uh, like as far as the, the wrestling, the wrestling itself wasn't necessarily for me. Uh, you know, people said online justifiably so that Gargano Miz was probably the best match of the night. And I think I agree. Sure. Uh, but like, I would go again, you know, like it wasn't like, Oh God, this was so boring. Like, I think just being there live makes it better for me. Like, I haven't gone back and watched the show yet. It's on my DVR, and I I will go and see how certain segments looked live. But, like, I just feel like if you could probably watch bad wrestling, but if you're there live, it's better, if that makes sense. Absolutely. part of the crowd, you know? I I was going to say, whether it be WWE, whether it be AEW, whatever, right? If Mm -hmm. TV comes to your town, go. It's, It's so much fun. Yeah. And hopefully That's next time I'll get an Alexa match. Hopefully, well, listen. Hopefully next time it's SmackDown, and I yeah I get a chance to see LA Knight in person, and I have the same reaction to LA Knight that you have to <laughs> Alexa Bliss. Yeah, like is it so much to ask for like an hour long Iron Woman match? You know. Anyways, next time. But thank you. I had a good time at the show. No, no problem at all, man. It was good to have everyone there. You know. Yep. All right, what do you got? All right. Uh, So, you know, AEW, uh, they did the angle two weeks ago where MJF got injured before the uh, big pay-per-view main event that he has, right? Mm -hmm. And he did a phoned-in podcast promo this week on TV, Mm -hmm. and it was fine, right? But uh, I'm glad that it came out that the real reason that MJF, MJF is off TV is that he's filming a part in the upcoming Iron Claw Von Eric family movie that Zach Efron definitely didn't go on steroids for. <laughs> yeah, I saw the pictures of fucking Zach. He's jacked. Right. Zach is jacked, right. <laughs> now, did you see who MJF is playing? Uh, I have no clue. Plus, I, I, I only know Carrie Von Eric. I don't know any other ones. Okay, so it's funny because MJF is playing Lance Von Eric, the That's fake Von Eric. Okay, see, I, I don't know what that means. Okay, so uh, so you know there's there's multiple Von Erics, right? Not anymore. <laughs> well, not anymore. <laughs> but at the time, to- so that's the thing. At the time, there were multiple Von Erics, and then not anymore very quickly, right? Yeah. So to fill out the bodies before, like, Mike was ready to get his in-ring debut, they just got this guy from Portland, who they would randomly mention on TV as Cousin Lance, right? Okay. And he wrestled in like the Portland, New England, the, uh, the the Pacific Northwest area as the fabulous Lance, and they brought him in as a fake Von Eric. They didn't say it's like, oh, it's a fake Von Eric, but like everyone knew he's a fake Von Eric, right? He, yeah, it, you know, all the boys, Kevin, Carrie, uh, Mike, um, you know, uh, they all had a similar look to them, right? And Lance didn't have that look, you know. Okay. Um, and then after whatever time it was of Lance not getting over, 
Lance went and worked for the competition in Texas. And then Fritz had to go on TV and bury Lance and say that, like, he was a fake Von Eric the whole time. He tricked them. And, uh, you know, all this other shit, right? So the fact that that's the character that MJF is playing in this movie is hilarious, right? Yeah, I'm, look- I'm looking at pictures of him right now. Even a dummy like me knows that he's not related to the other ones. Right, if you look at all of them together, like, eh, cousin, I guess, right? You know? Yeah. Um, But then like, the best was, like, Meltzer today was, like, well, you know, MJF's a great promo, and he's a really good worker, and Lance was neither of those things. So I'm not really sure why he was cast in the movie. Because it's a fucking movie. It, <laughs> it, none of it's real, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, you can't play Captain America. You weren't frozen in World War II. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, you can play anybody if you're a good actor, right? <laughs> and MJF convinces everyone that he's a, you know, that he's a jerk-off when he's, you know, sh- secretly a nice guy. Don't tell anyone. Um <laughs> But it's it's funny that the filming schedule of this comes in the middle of not being able to be on TV to promote his big pay-per-view main event world title match. Yeah. Well, he's selling an injury, Joe. Yeah. But, all right. Good, good for MJF. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to be the next Rock. You, know? hey, you never know, man. Uh, when The Rock was in The Scorpion King, where we all sitting here, it's like, Oh, this guy's going to take over Hollywood in 25 years or 20 years or whatever the hell it was. Nope. Yeah, all of my money was on uh, Stone Cold, and I I screwed up. (laughs) Yeah, well, Stone Cold screwed up, too. We made a lot of other mistakes that might have prevented that, you know? Yeah. All right. Um, I guess I will go next and just talk. I'll, I'll continue talking about Dynamite, and I'll just say, Joe, we got to see what is i know it's it's my dream match it quite possibly could have been yours as well as many other listeners and that of course i'm talking about sky blue versus jamie hater pause okay reaction no i'm kidding uh i'm not going to talk about that but i will just talk about ethan page versus eddie kingston uh the match that probably other people were looking forward to myself included um i will just say i'm very bummed that that was an opening round match. Uh, two people that I, I wish better things for in AEW. And, you know, you could say, I'll oh, give it time or whatever. But I, I wish that that was a second round or even a final in the tournament. Um, and I'll just say that I love Eddie Kingston. And I know he's a guy who could lose and doesn't necessarily need a world title. But you got to give this guy some wins. You know, it's I... I feel like it's been too long and i know you'll correct me but it, it just i you gotta give this guy some wins on television uh or else he's just gonna get lost in the mix and i don't want that to happen but it was nice to see it it was nice to see the build up uh that they gave the match i know they they showed a very quick aiw still and on youtube they showed a lot more of it um so that was nice uh so so match i would hope for more but uh overall it was an enjoyable Thing, but I just again I just wish I wish it was later in the tournament and I wish both guys could have won yeah um, so when I was at Rampage and they flashed up the graphic that this upcoming week on uh, Wednesday on Dynamite was going to be Page versus uh, Eddie um, and maybe I'm getting softer in my old age um, and you know maybe I could have worked myself into a shoot like many people on social media did this past week. Uh, but as soon as I saw that graphic, I'm like, oh, cool. That's going to be awesome. Eddie's losing, right? Yeah. I knew it immediately. Uh, um, just because Paige had been set up on TV to be in a position where he's going to win and move on to the next round or whatever, just like Ricky Starks was, right? And it's very clear on TV that that's who the finals are going to be at the pay-per-view and you know, who knows which way they're going to go. I'm guessing they're probably going to go Ricky because, like, the next set of TVs are in uh, Texas, which is where he's from, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's okay. Um, I thought the match, you know, I would have loved the match to have been longer. I would have loved the match to have been a little bit more competitive, like their AIW stuff, right? Um, Julian given, and Julian, it's Ethan Page given Kingston the big boy bomb off the top rope was, like, a crazy feat of strength, right? Yeah, scary and, for a second, but... Uh, and yeah. Eddie's, Eddie, you know, Eddie's no uh, slender reed of a man himself. 
And I'm like, oh, shit, I hope <laughs> I hope he doesn't pull, like, a muscle or something, you know, pulling this off, right? But it was uh-huh. a super impressive visual. Um, it was a strong win uh, for Paige. And you, you said, like, I want Eddie to rack up some wins, right? I said, I want Eddie to win every goddamn match he's in, right? But I also want Ethan Page to win every match he's in. I want Orange Cassidy to win every match that he's in. I want all these guys that I know to win every match that they're in. Everybody can't win all the time because then there's nobody to lose, you know? And there's only so much TV time. There's so many people on the roster. Everybody cycles through. Eddie's one of those guys where he doesn't need to win. When he came out for his match on AEW Dark, it was the loudest reaction until Moxley came out, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, he's over. And like, yes, eventually you're going to beat him so much that he's no longer going to be over, but it ain't yet. You know, um, there's still some time they can rehab him. He's in the middle of like whatever this anger management storyline thing that he has going on is, but that's like a simmer angle. The Ethan page thing is, is like, let's get it to the pay-per-view. Let's get the match with Ricky. Ricky's going to go on to the world title. And then we're going to figure everything else after that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I don't get that upset with Eddie losing on TV. I want him to win all the time, but again, everybody can't win all the time. Yeah, well, I get upset because I'm a true Eddie fan. Yeah, well. Not a fair weather fan like you. That, that's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. What else you got? So if if I didn't see enough goddamn wrestling this week live, uh, because I was at Rampage, I had to come home to watch SmackDown. And Adam on SmackDown, L.A. Knight comes out. He addresses the previous issue. He puts over Hagerstown, Maryland like he should. The Hollywood Hmm. multi-million dollar megastar from Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, He gives the poor ring announcer lady a hard time for getting it wrong. He even throws a Seinfeld reference in there for the olds. Because, again, you know, I know he may look youthful, (laughs) but... L.A. Knight is for the children or something. I don't know. Uh, he has a match with Ricochet. He wins the match with Ricochet uh, like a heel fashion. So uh, the L.A. Knight push, uh, you know, continues. And uh, Hagerstown, Maryland gets the respect on TV that it deserves. Well, thank God. That's what I say. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I, I have to apologize. I, I, I might have fast forwarded through all of his stuff. What? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know you'll recap it here, so I don't have to, you know, go over it frame by frame. But, yeah, I apologize. Maybe I'm team maximum male models. Maybe that's what it is. Well, listen, you see how that works out for you, you know? <laughs> Time will tell. You never know. When uh, a couple years from now, when they're, like, the undisputed tag team champions and Maxine is the undisputed women's champion... <laughs> Beating Charlotte at WrestleMania, then we'll talk. All right, that I'm that I'm in the that I'm in the park for. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's it for me. Do you have anything else you want to talk about, Joe? You don't have anything else? I did too. I don't come with extra work. Oh well listen, sometimes I come with like fourteen because I do got one more. Do it. We're not going to play the whole song. I need to get, like, a uh, cut where it goes right, right to say in my world, you know? Uh, but uh, Double J was on Dynamite this week. Of course, the A show in professional wrestling comes out, cuts a promo, puts over his crew, puts over Satinam Singh, takes a dig at Bronny Strowman, who was a dope on social media this past weekend, takes a dig at, uh, at Triple H running a sloppy shop over in Stamford, and then later on that night on Dynamite, they put up the match graphic. Uh, at the pay-per-view coming up, uh, as I look at a calendar here in, uh, what the hell is it, in uh, nine days, it's going to be Sting and someone else taking on Double J, Jeff Jarrett, and someone else. And I'm going to be there live for it. I can't wait. I cannot wait. I'm gonna, They're going to... Sting, I'm gonna get to see Sting live. I haven't seen. I don't think I've seen Sting wrestle live since Starcade '97. Wow. And like I've seen Jarrett wrestle, but like this is a different Jeff Jarrett. This is the last outlaw. 
this is like my world, Jeff Jarrett. This is the wee woo wee woo music. You know, it's like the Jarrett. It's like Jarrett in his final evolved form. All the money, all you know, all the everything. It's gonna be a, a stupid match. They're gonna take a bunch of like nobody's gonna bump. They're gonna walk and brawl. I hope they walk and brawl over by me, so you can see me <laughs> crying on camera. Um, <laughs> Sting is awesome. Double J is more awesome. And like, I hope they do like a thing on Rampage as well, so I can get double Jeff Jarrett that weekend. <laughs> uh, but Jarrett's the best man, and like him coming out and cut the promo, and then like I knew that like he comes out last week on TV and cuts the promo. I'm like, oh, okay, they're doing a match at the pay per view. It's gonna be a tag match, right? It's very clear. And then like all the build is like, why is Jeff Jarrett in AEW? It's like he's gonna wrestle Sting at the pay per view, right? And then like. <laughs> after the match with Jay Lethal and Sanjay. Sanjay's like, everybody wants to know why Jeff Jarrett's here. And I'm like, I know why he's here, because he's going to wrestle a match with Sting at the pay-per-view. And then Jeff comes out and he starts his promo. Everybody wants to know why Jeff Jarrett's here. And I'm like, I know, guys. We're going to wrestle Sting at the pay-per-view, okay? <laughs> it's yeah. not a mystery. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I just want to address the fact that his, his arms are so big because he's always carrying the, that bag. You know? Oh, the guitar, <laughs> the bag, the Global Force Gold. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this over the week. God help me. You got me to the point where I'm thinking about Jeff Jarrett. I hate you for this. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and I also think it was because I was listening to We Need Wrestling. Uh, Brett wasn't there, but Michelle was there. Michelle knocked it out of the park. So Brett let her, or DJ let her know. Um, and they were talking about the last week Jarrett angle where sting air quote sting showed up and and it was just that dude from the factory. You know, I don't even know his name. Uh, And I was thinking this is what they should have done. And and this is a way too late fantasy booking, but like they should have did the lights go out, the lights go out and have sting in the ring with the baseball bat, like fake sting. And then lights go out, lights go out. And when they come back on, the baseball bat is replaced with the guitar and have, you know, Darby get hit with the guitar and then have Jarrett unmask his sting. Because he's already wearing, like, the coat, you know what I'm saying, and, like, the, the black outfit. So all he would have had to do is, like, hide his hair. Uh, and I think that that would have been more impactful than the fart in church that was that guy being sting and then having Jarrett show up a few seconds later. You know, like you wouldn't have to have that disappointment in the middle and, and just go right to the shock and awe of it. You know, I don't know. What do you oh. think? Um, Anything that they do with um, Jarrett would have been fine. I think what you projected they could do like next week on Dynamite, you know? Yeah. Maybe it's just the turmoil booker in me, but I just think that like having that little failed reaction in the middle and then going with Jarrett just seemed like a waste. Have Jarrett be the reveal of the per- of Sting. Okay, so the boy who was fake Sting uh, mm. is Cole Carter. Okay, and yeah. you might know Cole Carter better as Troy Donovan. Okay, <laughs> still don't know who that is. Okay, you might know Troy Donovan better as Troy. Two dimes, Donovan from NXT. Oh, it's Tony Pepperoni's guy. He was okay. He was one of Tony Pepperoni's guys, and uh, Tom Green, friend of the show, sometimes call of the show, uh, m- pointed out on social media that do you think they had that guy be fake Sting so that they could say that Jarrett drew at least two dimes in professional wrestling? <laughs> Because <laughs> the the whole thing is like everyone's like oh broke a million guitars never drew a dime right and like you're taking the word of Mike fucking Graham okay who was like a like he got a job because WCW wanted to keep a stranglehold on Florida he wrestled on one pay per view and he big league 1992 Jushin Thunder Liger because he's a piece of shit himself right. Mm -hmm. Um, he's also the one that when, like, the Radicals were going to leave WCW, he threatened not only to fight them, he threatened that he was going to murder them as they left the pay-per-view that night to go to World Wrestling Entertainment, right? (laughs) So, you're all, like, you all hate Jeff Jarrett so much, stock in Mike Graham, of all people, so that's who you're backing. Look who I'm backing, Double J, you keep backing Mike Graham, 
fuck all y'all. Um, but yeah, so that was his whole line. He broke a million guitars, never drew a dime. Tom Green makes the joke because the guy was two dimes in WWE. That's why Jared interacted with them. So he drew two dimes. I'm going to miss that comedy gold when Twitter goes away. Ah, oh, stop it. We're saving it for the voicemail, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure every call is about Twitter being like doing the fucking Thanos snap uh, <laughs> this episode comes out, you know? Yeah. All right. Do you have any more Jeff Jarrett segments? I know we should just have that be like a recurring thing at this point, you know? Can I play <laughs> the music again? Uh, go ahead. Again, it's going to be very embarrassing when that music <laughs> plays at the pay-per-view and he comes out. Uh, I might have to walk away from DJ and Brett because I will I will be embarrassing them. <laughs> just do what I did at Raw and just be like, guys, that's just my cell phone in my pants. That's just my cell phone. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but, Joe, you need to uh, mix it up. Get us the, the spooky version of that that he used at the Flair last match. All right. Next week, uh, I'll have the spooky version. Excellent. All right. So I'll let you decide. You want to do homework? You want to do phone calls? Let's do homework. I feel like phone calls is the thing where, that like I just get on my phone and start looking at the internet during. So let's do that towards the end. How dare you? Yeah. Well, that's what you do during weekly purchases. <laughs> obligation you owe your family and yourself. Home, home, homework. Homework, it's an obligation you owe your family and yourself. All right, and Joe, you, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm only on my phone during weekly purchase because you're sending me texts of the fucking <laughs> things that you bought. I see your tweets. I see timestamps. All, right. <laughs> All right, you assigned to me. Yes. The Chikara return. You only live twice from five twenty four fourteen. And before you get to the show proper, there was a YouTube playlist. As as Joe is all grown up, he made a YouTube playlist. I figured out how the internet works. Excellent. It's about time. But we have on that YouTube playlist a bunch of segments called Rough Waters, and then. Uh, some uh, basically recaps, and we'll get into this as we go, and then an event center. But I just want to say the Rough Waters thing is following the the transformation of Dalton Castle. Um, and actually, I apologize, Joe. Do your little intro and our shout-outs. I oh, yeah, so just going to throw it out there and say um, if you did not get a chance to watch this, you can always go to, over to our friend Kevin Hellion's uh, blog, MassLibrary.com. He always has a write-up for whatever the homework is. Uh, also... I do my best in the show, you know, to, to say, like, oh, watch this or skip that. And I will say this, in the future when I assign more Chikar events, assume there's something after the credits. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, all right, so Rough Waters is uh, four parts, I believe. But uh, I just want to say, I had never seen Dalton Castle prior to Ring of Honor, you know, when he's doing his flamboyant character with the boys. But I knew he was Ashley Remington in Chikara. Um, however, I didn't know he started off as Dalton Castle. So I, I'll just want to, before I get into this, ask you, I have never seen in any of our uh, watching of Chikara, I've never seen Dalton Castle. When did he show up in Chikara? Did we just miss him? Did we kind of skip over his stuff? Or did he kind of just show up during the shutdown? He was on a bunch of the random wrestling is shows here and there. Okay. Um, and it was one of those things where, especially around this time, was the beginning. Well, it had always been this way for the most part. That if you are from somewhere else and you come to Chikara, you're getting a new gimmick. Okay. Uh, but this was like the f like one of the first in a long time like semi established name on the Indies like Dalton Castle uh, wrestled mostly like in the upstate New York area he was with like Jimmy and Colin and Brody and all those guys like he was like a lot of times like the fourth in the car when they would come to shows um, everybody liked him he was a real nice guy still is a really nice guy um, bit of a wild one you know he's definitely calmed down a lot in recent years. Uh, but this time was also like the beginning of him starting to calm down a little bit. And uh, this uh, gimmick was kind of put together for him and he uh, embraced it with uh, both hands, you know? 
Yeah. So in part one, uh, Dalton Castle is singing the praise of Waterworld while he finds out that his uncle Lester, Lester Crabtree, who I didn't realize was uh, Darkness Crabtree until later on in this, but Uncle Lester is dead and he left something to Dalton in his will. Uh, During part two, he meets uh, Uncle Lester's lawyer, uh, finds out that his uncle left his DVD collection to a potted plant, but then gives... Uh, Dalton a check and it's for a lot of money and the only caveat is that Dalton must live the lifestyle befitting of a man of that stature Uh, as a fancy gentleman I know all about that so we're good there Uh, and for part three uh, we find out uh, it's basically Dalton as I don't know if he was Ashley Remington at this point but he's doing a voiceover and he, he says hey look at all the integrity over there did it rain integrity last night uh, he transforms and things going forward are going to be smooth uh, I love that one part three was hilarious um, part four was I gather it was at a yacht rental place but I don't know why but mine didn't have any sound on this video Joe uh, yes but- Ashley uh, Remington shows up with, like, two hot chicks at the yacht rental place, I assume, buying yachts. I don't know. What happened there? So I guess whatever music they were playing, they didn't have the rights to. So to not get the video pulled from YouTube, instead of, like, you know, redoing the audio or something, they just completely just wiped the audio out of it. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, after that, we have... Uh, two different like recap videos to kind of let you know like what led up to the shutdown. Um, you know, there's a King of Trios 2011 finals is recap. The Colony winning their rival with the Kikito. Uh, the introduction of Chikara Metrics and how that broke up some of those stables. The formation of Colony Extreme Force and Soldier Ant resigning. Um, I didn't realize, like, it, again, it might have just been talked about on commentary and I missed it, but, uh, you know, when Wink Vavasaur was placed in power, uh, that was because Worldwide Media Development Corporation was uh, had purchased Shikara. Uh, I, I had never heard that name mentioned. Uh, and I just want to know, who's the British lady doing the recaps? Uh, sounds very good voiceover person. <laughs> no clue. Yeah. Um, and then, like, for part two, we get uh, kind of like some the stuff that was in the Ashes movie. Chikar is trying to put uh, Ic- Icarus is trying to put Chikar back together. You know, people are wearing I am Chikar shirts and there's public demonstrations. Uh, the sh- uh, They ran a show in a park, uh, which between you and me kind of sound is kind of lame. Like, I get that this is all like story driven and it's a, to build up a grassroots thing, but. Some of this stuff is kind of extreme. Uh, Condor security raids it, and they they just, like, abduct somebody. uh, And their scavenger hunts to find incriminating documents about a a land deal on a swamp and T-Tor conglomerate. Uh, I like I like a bit, Joe. I like a good bit. Uh, This is where I was like, all right, Chikar, let's 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 slow this down a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was, so this was a lot of, like, filling in that backstory, like, if you weren't fully involved, they mentioned, like, on the Chikara 101 message board, and the fans, and the scavenger hunts, and the live events, and all this other shit, right? Yeah. Um, so the match in the park, and there's a rest, there's a, the, uh, the Condor security grabs a fan, and they kidnap the fan, right? Uh and then there was a scavenger hunt to like find the fan or whatever it was. I'm almost certain that the scavenger hunt was the Friday after Thanksgiving that year. And uh, when Quack was sending out the things to have people do this, everyone's like, fuck no. Like, we all have stuff to do. It's like the holidays, you know? Yeah. Um, I know we did the thing in the park. Uh, they do a good job of hiding it, so I'm not going to say who. Uh, but Tom, the fan, was uh, definitely a wrestler from Chikara, right? Okay. Uh, and it was funny to see those two big, burly, beefy Condor security guys roughing up that little guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Every time they show uh, Condor security, they keep showing this one. And th- that dude is, like, nearly seven feet tall. I- terrifying, <laughs> you know? So uh, very worried every time I see Condor security on my screen. Um. 
And then we get an event center um, with Bryce. There's an Eddie Kingston promo where he's wearing a very sensible polo. And he says that for a, for basically the entire year that Shakara was shut down, a lot of people have been questioning him about his match with Icarus. You know, like, would he have won? Would he have tapped out to the Chikara special? Kind of getting under his skin, questioning the validity of him still being the champion. And, uh, you know, has anything really changed with Icarus? All he's doing is waiting for his lost father to show up, meaning Gennetti, who who didn't show up to their big match. Um, but that's uh, that's it for the uh, sh- the YouTube stuff. Yeah, and I'll, I'll have to do a better job because a lot of these videos I forgot were, like, put into the show itself. Yeah, I mean, only the Eddie Kingston promo was. Oh, well, no, actually, the, the, re- the recap stuff was in the middle because I fast-forwarded through that. Right. But that was fine. I mean, we're, it it makes more sense to have it before you start the show. You know? Right. All right. So you only live twice. Um, we have opening it up. We have the BDK versus the Spectral Envoy. I'll just say very big crowd. Lots and lots of people there, as you would expect with uh, Chikar's return. Uh, Leonard F. Chikarson and Gavin are opening up the show. Uh, Gavin looking very handsome in a picture that's circulating Twitter today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have no idea who this BDK is. Uh, I know that the the white suit Walter guy, uh, uh, Myler Schnitzler or whatever was <laughs> Milo on. Schnitzel. I think he. I, I think I mentioned last time when we did like the little recap video from the wrestling is cool shutdown. He's fake Jakob. And uh, I think he was one of Max Smashmaster's trainees. Okay, yeah, I mean he was definitely on uh, like the the wrestling is fun and the wrestling is like recap show that you had to yeah. watch. But uh, didn't know who Aries was or Knock In. Um, they had they got a big no one missed you chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, their opponents were Frightmare, uh, Ultraman is black, and Hollow Wicked. Hollow Wicked looking great as always. Uh, they were jumped as they were coming out uh, by Tursus. Yes. Um, basically, we have two giant dudes with horns. So you have Tursus and Nakin. Um, so that they're pretty impressive. Uh, but anyways, as far as the match itself, the heels start off strong. The Envoy ends up doing flippy, kicky things to get the advantage. But eventually Mantis is caught by the two bulls trying to do a jump from the top rope to the outside. And the BDK defeats uh, Frightmare via Ragnarok, which is like a cool like pendulum type thing that they do. Yeah, so uh, working backwards, uh, Ragnarok, the pendulum gimmick. Um, Dark Order actually stole that. They do it on AEW. TV now. Yeah, I knew it looked familiar. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks better when you have two giant dudes doing the holding, though. You yeah. Know? Well, they would always have ten, and uh, John Silver do it, you know? <laughs> well, that's true. You got me there. <laughs> uh, but, so Ares was the original leader of the original BDK, which was the big heel turn. We should go back and watch that, like, older stuff, Chikara, like the Claudio heel turn of the BDK, and you get to see me take my one bump in professional wrestling that allows me to critique professional wrestling. <laughs> um, yeah. But, like, the original BDK, you know, dissolves as people leave or are no longer booked or get signed by World Wrestling Entertainment. So, like, they do a Falls Kind of Anywhere match between Mantis and Ares, and that kind of runs Ares out of the company until they come back with this. Um, Tursus is the original Tursus. Uh, You may have seen him in the lead-up to this, maybe unmasked, and we'll talk about that off mic. Uh, Mm -hmm. Knockin is a notorious, world-famous piece of shit known as TJ Marconi. Uh, TJ Marconi, who drove to a fan uh, or to a student show, to uh, challenge to beat up my friend Chad Shaft for mean tweets. Uh, He paid two tolls coming into and out of New Jersey to go say to him, tweet me to my face. Um, He has also been making fun of both privately and publicly, uh, mentally and physically challenged fans. He's more or less blackballed from most professional wrestling, and someone who was not on the Saudi shows and not on Raw this past week has done everything in their power to make sure that they never get extra work ever again. Uh, nice. Fuck PJ Marconi. He's a piece of shit. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, and we're skipping some stuff here, but obviously next up is Ashley Remington, smooth sailing Ashley Remington versus Chuck Taylor, Chucky e. T. Um, 
is this the first time we're seeing Chuck Taylor where he's not like dressed in fist attire in Chikara? Because obviously yes. there was the but, big like gap. Yeah, for like so when he first came into Chikara in like 06, he wasn't part of Fist. Sure. He becomes part of Fist, but like since the whole shutdown and whatever, this is just Chuck Taylor on his own. Yeah, you know, Kentucky gentleman Chuck Taylor. Uh so Ashley Remington comes out with uh two beautiful ladies as his sides. Uh LFC at one point says that he smelled Ashley's uh hair as he walked by and it smelled like lavender. Uh they're putting over uh, I think it was LFC and uh was it Bryce? On it was Bryce. Yeah, just basically putting how over how polite Ashley is and just enchanted by his smoothness. Yes. Uh, this was basically just two people just gloating over Remington <laughs> the entire match, which was great. Like, I'm not blowing smoke up uh, up LFC's ass. <laughs> like, it was really good. Uh, the fact that he was just so enchanting, you know? Uh, at one point, Chuck misses a top rope moonsault. Ashley wins via anchors away submission in what is called the most impressive debut in uh, wrestling history. Uh, his ladies come out and give Ashley a fruit basket, which Remington then presents to Chuck Taylor. And uh, Chuck basically swoons over the fruit basket and over how charming Ashley Remington is. And I'll tell you what, Joe, I'm here for it. I, I, this has got me hooked. Uh, we'll get into when we get into in a moment or two that maybe I'm losing interest in some other stuff, but uh, maybe mm. Remington is uh, is willing to take that spot, you know, not a liver spot or whatever, but that spot. Uh, so yeah, so we're, I'm gonna do my best to get as much actually Remington stuff on here. Um, you know, if you couldn't tell from commentary, the the character, the name, the presentation was all Bryce's idea. Oh really? Uh, okay. Yes, and Bryce worked very closely with Dalton Castle to do the character and everything. Um, and it's one thing to hear Bryce on commentary when you when we get to a, a, a match where Bryce is doing refereeing for an Ashley Remington match. Uh, it's a complete. It's like the same thing, but like all physical, you know. Yeah. Um, this was a great example because uh, usually I love doing commentary with Bryce. But a lot of times we yes and each other. Bryce is trained and he's a professional when it comes to improv and comedy and stuff like that. I'm just a jamoke who was in the right place at the right time. Um, but I feel as though many times we would have really good chemistry. And I feel as though a lot of times we would like sometimes get too busy yes anding and get away from the match. This was the perfect thing where we needed to yes and each other to get this character over. Yeah. But, I mean, it worked. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well done there. Uh, I and don't know. I'll, if I'll, and, I'll, and I'll just throw out in between these two things where there was a trailer for the movie of Ashes, and I said, "Don't remind me." <laughs> uh, I was about to say there are some stuff that uh, popped up that I wasn't sure if I was supposed to skip or not, but I just happened to catch, and I think it's important for the overall storyline. Uh, I am introduced to Chikara's new owner, Robbie Ellis. And uh, this this old guy basically introduces the new director of fun, Mike Quackenbush, with his very legitimate uh, right leg injury. Uh, he has a, a, a very quack type promo uh, with the same acting and uh, same enthusiasm as his role in Ashes. And uh, I don't know if I, I feel like I might have missed this, but it was mentioned on commentary later when he did commentary that. He's bringing back the King of Trios, but I don't remember him actually saying that in that promo. No, he doesn't. He, he doesn't say it in this promo here. Uh, Robbie Ellis is a New England area wrestler who's been like around forever. Like he was still an active wrestler, maybe like a year or two before this event, right? Okay. Um, he was in a group of the like the fabulous ones. It was him. It was Sweeney. It was Mitch Ryder, and it was. Uh, his assistant there who came out with them, uh, a good friend of mine, Shane Hawk, um, good friend of, th he was, he was the one who filmed all the 3.0 stuff in Ashes, which is why it was probably good. <laughs> um, so Robbie Ellis retires, the storyline is Robbie Ellis retires from wrestling. Uh, uh, he's an art collector, art gallery, whatever. When the sale of Chikara comes up, because ch wrestling is art and Chikara is art, he purchased Chikara because wrestling is a great art form, whatever. Quits quack in charge. Um, there's a King of Tri Trios promo later in the show where it's like a Lego motif for it. Um, quack, though, cuts the promo talking about like how, 
you know, he is Chikara and you are Chikara because all the I am Chikara shirts. Um, and I think that might come up, and if it doesn't, we'll deal with it later. Uh, but as Quack is naming specific people, uh, he says, Tom Holzerman, you are Chikara. Daniel Matheson, you are Chikara. And just on those two names alone, I wish Chikara was dead sooner than it died. <laughs> all right. Um, there was a Jimmy Jacobs promo in there. Uh, there was also an Icarus promo, basically calling out Eddie Kingston that he didn't really do much to bring back Chikara. And I don't know if I think this was brought up maybe by uh, Mass Library, uh, but like Eddie Kingston wasn't in the the brawl, you know, that for the return show, you know, that led up to the return, you know, so he was in ashes and he seemed like he was going to help the fight. But Icarus brings up the fact that when we needed a champion, where was Eddie? And then we get the same Eddie uh, promo that was from the event center. Right, and that's that's on me. I should have did a better job to know that it was in the, uh, yeah. yeah. Don't worry about it. All right, so next up we have Archibald Peck versus Jimmy Jacobs. Uh, Jimmy Jacobs does like an elbow drop onto the basketball court uh, floor, which uh, missed with a thud, looked kind of painful. Um, but basically Jimmy tries preventing Archie from landing his new move, but Archie does hit his new move, which is 10 DDTs in a row. Uh, and if 10 DDTs in a row doesn't result in a pin, I'm sure Jake Roberts is rolling over in his grave. Uh, but the guys who accompanied Jacobs to the ring in the Marty Skrull masks, they interfere. They lead to Jacobs picking up the win. And, and uh, I will just say that while commentary did say that this is Archibald's uh, return to the timeline, uh, they better start doing something with Archie because I am losing interest. I am a short attention span man. And uh, if there isn't something to, to bring this back, because, uh, I mean, prior to the shutdown, it was teased that maybe maybe Archie was uh, going to go the Rudos route. And now it's just uh, business as usual. And I don't like that. So they need to do something to shake up Archibald Peck. Um. Yeah, they do. They, uh, you know, not to spoil anything, but he does, um, him and 3.0 become a regular on screen, uh, tandem. All right. Better be worth it. Cause yeah. otherwise, otherwise, uh, smooth sailing is going to take that spot in my heart, you know? Yeah. I, I thought this match was okay. Um, I thought the Jimmy Jacobs promo was, uh, strangely not good for a Jimmy Jacobs promo. Yeah, um, talk about it yeah yeah and then um i forget who the one uh of the the masked goons with jimmy jacobs is but the other one the bigger the beefier one uh becomes a regular in chikar gotcha uh there was also a promo that i happened to catch where green ant talks about how he's no longer a rookie he's no longer green he's now silver ant um and then we get to the main events the grand champion, Eddie Kingston versus Icarus. So at this point, Eddie Kingston is like the most hated heel in the company, which uh, again, Mass Library made a good point to point out that like not too long ago in Chikara history, at least. And I get it that a lot of time has passed, but uh, he went very quickly from being the most beloved person in the company to being the, as hated as he is. Uh, so much so that the crowd is throwing rolls of paper towels, uh, toilet paper at him. Um, but Icarus comes out in a new full bodysuit gear, uh, you know, covering up the tattoo. We don't have to worry about him taking off the jacket because he's a white meat baby face. And uh, match almost ends early because Icarus almost hooks the Chikara special right off the rip. Uh, Eddie's getting pissed. He's throwing trash cans. He's getting chairs. Um, Eddie does the repeat elbow spot to the head of Icarus, kind of like the Blackpool Combat Club does. And that reminded me, Joe, of like when Eddie Kingston was like they were teasing the feud with Claudio, having beef in AEW, and then Eddie almost sets Brian Danielson on fire. And then I was like, oh man, remember when like Eddie Kingston was being treated like really well in AEW? And I got sad and I had stop to like, stop for a little bit. Uh, but anyways, the locker room empties to watch the match. Eddie's starting to focus on Icarus's neck. And he kicks out, I'm sorry, Icarus kicks out at two from the back fist of the future. Uh, and Joe, like I've said before, I've made a conscious effort to avoid as many spoilers as I can on not only Chikara history, but specifically the lineage of like the Grand Championship. The only thing I know about the Grand Championship is that at some point Dasher and Mr. Touchdown have it. 
Uh, that's all I know. So I don't know anything going into this match. Uh, but the fact that Icarus kicks out of the back fist of the future, I'm like, okay, shit's happening. Um, Icarus makes the mistake of trying to go strike for strike with Eddie. Start, keeps getting rocked. Icarus hits the Blu-ray and then gets the Chikara special. And Eddie does not tap out, but he passes out. And Icarus is your new grand champion, ending a two-and-a-half-year reign of Eddie Kingston. Right. So like Kevin said, and of course, um, like you mentioned, some of these bits here, um, especially in those last, the last match or two, the build of the match at the Trocadero with Icarus. Obviously, Icarus very firmly positioned as a burgeoning babyface. Eddie very strongly worked heel in that match. And all the other things that Icarus mentioned in the promo, that, like, while Chikara was dead and Eddie was their champion, he should have been the one, uh, you know, championing for Chikara to come back. He wasn't. Icarus was. So this was a very strong and loyal fan base that had been waiting for this moment, as you saw. Easton was packed, and you're going to see the next time that they come back to Easton for King of Trios, it's packed as well. Um, but it's just, you know, that's how wrestling storytelling works. And, you know, uh, this is not the end of Eddie and Icarus's story. Um, you know, obviously, I mentioned uh, Ashley Remington is going to come up as much as I can. Uh, Eddie is going to come up as much as I can in this whole storyline as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I will take all the Eddie King sneak and yeah. give me. I don't care. Um, after the credits. Oh, uh, oh, wait. Oh, before, yes. Okay, before you get to the credits. Okay, so uh, I remember this match. Um, so, uh, you were mentioning, okay, so, uh, so about seven minutes in, they're like, sl you know, they're, 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 it's like a slug fest. They're like hitting each other, strike, 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 strike. Um, and then about a minute or so later is when the locker room starts coming out. Okay. And locker room's out and Eddie gets the advantage and he gives Icarus a power bomb. And I get, I might accidentally say real names and here I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I, again, gives Icarus a power bomb. And I'm like, oh, that's right. I remember Icarus got a concussion in this match. Was it from that power bomb? And then when I see Icarus get up, and we mention it on commentary, that he looks like he's fucked up. And we don't say that because it's Chikar. But then, like, he's fucked up. Go back and watch that match from, like, nine minutes nine minutes into the match or so when he, Eddie gives him a power bomb. And Icarus, like, like he could barely stand. Uh, he tries to get Eddie up for the Blu-ray, like, three times before he finally does, and he barely gets him up. And obviously yeah. the the Chikara special is like a convoluted, stupid move anyway. But what Icarus puts on Eddie is not the Chikara special. And at one point, like you see Eddie like moving himself because he knows how the move is supposed to go. And like he's grabbing Icarus's arm to like grab his arm, you know? Yeah. Because he's out of it. He's done, you know? Yeah, because that power, that power bomb, I noticed like that was a sick power bomb. Yeah, it? yeah. It would have thought, but I didn't realize he was concussed. And I saw Eddie moving Icarus's foot like out of his face during the Chikara special, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And then, like I said, so I watch it, and the match happens, and the match is over, credits start to roll, and I see there's nine minutes left. And I'm like, oh, that's right, there's a bunch of shit that happens after the, after the main event, right? And then yeah. when Kevin puts his write-up up, and I read his write-up like I always do, and I'm like, I send him a message, I'm like, I go, dude, there's like a whole thing that happens after the credits. And he goes, oh, there is? He goes, oh, I'm going to have to watch. I'm like, yeah. I go, it's like huge what happens after the credits, you know? Yeah. Um, so like I said, if I assign any Chikara stuff, if I forget to say it, assume there's shit after the credits. Fair enough. Uh, after the credits, a bunch, all the heels come out of the locker room. Uh, the Flood, uh, my favorite, which is the, the guy with the big cube head. Uh, and some dude in, like, a really cool mask that has, like, like wires or tubes coming out of the back of it. Very, like, post-apocalyptic slash steampunk. Just, a, like, a really big dude. And uh, they don't say who he is because, obviously, it's – I think we're, we're seeing the debut of him here. Uh, but he brings out two people that are under masks or hoods, so to speak, and they are Delirious and Soldier Ant. And once the hoods are pulled off, Delirious and Soldier Ant uh, attack all the, the baby faces. And then Tube's mask guy uh, basically does a murder on Cobalt, and that's how we end the show. Yes. So uh, obviously Delirious had been previously brainwashed by Mantis with the Eye of Tear, but Mantis is a baby face now. Uh, this is the Titor people, the Flood, whatever, undoing that brainwashing, and, you know, Delirious specifically goes after Mantis. 
Uh, Soldier Ant had not been seen for whatever time. Uh, they mind wipe him, and that's why he goes after the colony members specifically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so the big guy's name is Ducalion. Um, at one point on commentary, I'm like, I could see something written on the back of his jacket. I'm trying to make out what his name is, right? I know what his name is. It's on the back of his jacket, right? <laughs> Well, well, I mean, t- to your credit, I mean, during the pre-show, somebody broke the monitors. So that's true. You guys to see, you know. Um, yeah, and where we were set up, uh, we mentioned a million times on commentary, where we were set up, like, we literally could not see most of the action. Like, we were, like, standing and looking to our rights to see the show, because that's how many people were there, you know? Yeah. Um, so Ducalion then does a murder on Cobalt. Okay. So Cobalt told everyone that he had medical issues and he was taking time off. Okay, mm-hmm. but apparently what had happened was uh, he his wife had found out that while Shakar was on the road, he was fooling around on her. Okay, all right. And this was his way of getting written out of storylines. Now, again, Cobalt will, is the first, but he will not be the last person to die at the hands of Ducalion. More times than not, this is the way that we write character or people out of our storylines from now until the end of, like, the set of shows that we're watching, okay? Um, I'll tell the whole Ducalion story when we get to his write-off at the end of the year, right? Okay. Uh, But other than that, um, yeah, so uh, if you remember from Ashes, and who doesn't, uh, when 3.0 go to visit Archie in his shed and he's got a rip hunter board and there's a bunch of things that I made a point to mention, who is the Titan of Titor? Ducalion is the Titan of Titor. Okay. See, now I know what T- I didn't know what Titor was at the time that that was like right. the company that, that was running Chikara. Yes. Gotcha. Oh, and that's the other thing that I forgot to mention is, um, you know, from all the things that were put together, uh, from the previously on Chikaras, that T4 conglomerate um, purchasing Chikara was their way to get a foothold in and build a quote radical extremist compound. <laughs> yeah, because that's what they were saying, like the land deals and stuff like that. Yes. Like, yeah. All right. <laughs> so now that that like nonsense of Chikara is out of the way. A new kettle of nonsense that we can open up, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I mean, for now, I'm still here for it. Like I said, some people need to step their shit up, but uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing, uh, and again, don't spoil anything, but like, I want to see Icarus's reign. I want to see Eddie Kingston still be uh, a top guy, hopefully. I want to see them do something with uh, Archibald Peck, and I want to see lots and lots of smooth sailing Ashley Remington, you know? So, We'll see what happens. I will do my best to uh, to tailor the shows and matches and so forth to those things. I'm no dummy. Yeah. All right, Joe. You want to know what your homework is? Yes, I do. All right. So this, this homework makes sense because not only is it something that's appropriate that I would assign, but I feel like it's timely given our recent experiences. And with that being said, uh, after we went to Monday Night Raw this week, uh, I'd said to a lot of people, oh, this was my first time going to a TV taping since I was at an episode of Nitro. And, or not Nitro, I, I was saying Thunder. And it got me to thinking, I was like, no, I, I'm forgetting a lot of things here. Like, I, These are all like 20 years ago and they're all blurring together. So I learned that not only did I go to an episode of SmackDown at the arena. Oh, okay. Because it popped into my memory because I I remember there was a lady in front of me that was bragging to everyone around her that she's friends with Nick Dinsmore. Oh. That's why why that popped into my head. So I was like, okay, I was at a SmackDown, but I have no recollection of what show it was or anything like that. So I was like, you know what? What was the thunder that I was at? And I was looking it up online. And Joe, I have a, a huge Mandela effect. I was never at a thunder. I was at a nitro. And that's what we're going to watch. <laughs> emanating from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, WCW Monday Nitro on January 31st, a day after my birthday, 2000. 
available on the cock. If you want to jump on the cock, go and watch it. So it's funny because when DJ Brett and myself went out to uh, uh, Dynamo or Rampage this week, right? Mm. We didn't know at the time that we were going to be going to Raw. You know, like so the Raw thing just kind of happened. So we were talking about the last, and we were like, oh, Raw, whatever. And then we were talking about the last time when WCW was there. And we were taught, we, like, I know this card because I was looking at it okay. um, on Friday. And it's a fun show. Did you look at it to see what's on the card? Uh, I. All I remember, because this is what made me remember that this was the show, I was like, I'm looking for the one that has Norman Smiley wrestling. So I know because he ran by me in the crowd when he was trying to escape. Uh, And then obviously I see the header on Peacock, but I've done my best to try to avoid everything else. Okay, so I will do my best then not to ruin this um, on you because this is a Nitro that takes place in between Russo runs. Yep. Um, this is a post radicals leaving to go to WWE. And I think the head to head raw this night was the radicals debut on raw. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. But, uh, it's, it looks like this will give you an opportunity to hit that, your new favorite button. Cause I'm seeing that a certain, uh, bad getter is listening <laughs> in the description. <laughs> We'll have to get his that his theme from that era, and I'm not watching the version of the cock. I'm going to go and acquire uh, this by legal means. I assure you to watch it as it aired, and if you want to watch it the correct way, you know, hit me up and I'll help you out. You know? Yeah, I did, uh, just send it to me <laughs> or send me the link when we're done. I did last times, and you're like, oh, I didn't watch that. I watched it off the peacock. Yeah. See, the problem is it's it's a pain in the ass for me to watch computer stuff on my TV. You know, because I'm not casting it and whatever, but I'll figure it out. But, yes, you. anyways. I'm going to cast uh, you. <laughs> uh, but like I said, I'm just surprised. Like, not only did I completely forget that I was at a SmackDown, and again, that had to be like 2005. Like, when was the Eugene character around? Uh, it would have been 2000. So it probably would have been like 2005 because I was at that same SmackDown. It okay. was when Stephanie comes out as the GM. Uh, they do vignettes for... Um, Rey Mysterio making his debut. Um, and I, this was like whenever Edge and Hogan were the tag champs. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Because so even that that's seventeen years ago. That was the last TV taping I was at. Right. And before that was this Nitro. So, uh, the Raw this past week. You know, first time in a long time. But looking forward to watch this. You know me. I love WCW two thousand. Everybody loves WCW 2000. Yep. All right. All right. Let's get into some phone calls, hey? Let's do it. Hey, Adam. Hey, Joe. It is Kevin Ford. And uh, I wanted to call because this week's homework gave me some warm and fuzzies, as Eddie Kingston uh, would have said during the Ashes stuff. Yuck. Uh, Because I actually have fond memories of hanging with Joe during this weekend. Uh, This, I would say, for, for Joe and I is at least part of like the what what led to our friendship now like i remember during the shutdown i was having this uh podcast interview series that i did and then like the fall of 2013 i did one with joe which is uh, available on youtube joe's favorite podcasting platform hmm. but then the next time we saw each other in person was at the jayla 2014 weekend that was the one and only time i drove out to uh cleveland for an aiw weekend and uh it was a lot of fun and I forget if it was after night one or night two. Uh, I think it was after night one. There was like an after party at a local place, and I got to talk to Joe. And the two things I remember most are, one was Joe talking to my friend Casey about RuPaul's Drag Race. And number two was Joe presenting me with his phone and showing me all the accounts he had on Twitter to try and prove that he is not words they gave. Now, I don't necessarily put it past Joe to have deleted that account from Twitter before doing so, knowing that this... A uh, chance may have come up, but I digress. Um, but I know that Joe was also there. You know, he did the jailing. He also did the same drive to, to Easton, and that was that was quite the trip. And the other thing I really remember about that show was showing up um, pretty much right at the time to the building and some student up front telling us that the Easton parking lot was full, which I had been to Easton at least twice before, and that parking lot is enormous. So I thought, oh, my God, this show was 
must be packed. And so we like parked in an adjoining neighborhood, hoping not to get towed and went to the show. And sure enough, it was packed. Um, so I guess uh, my questions for Joe would be uh, going into this show. Did you, were, was the, the crew aware that this was going to be the largest attended Chikar show to date? And I think it would end up being the largest Chikar show and uh, attended ever. And two, was there a lot of things that were kept a surprise from you guys like there were with the finale? Like, I know there was an extra match that wasn't announced. Tursus being part of the BDK trio was a surprise. Uh, I don't think that they they announced anything about, like, Robbie Ellis and Quack on the show. And then, of course, the big ending. How much of that were you aware of? How much of that I was surprised? Very interested to know. Um, this was a very exciting wrestling weekend for me. And even though the show was ended up being kind of ho-hum in retrospect, it was a big deal. So really glad you guys got to cover it. Hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I Crap, I was going to end up saying something about Adam buying a bunch of different covers of comic books. But you'll talk about that. And he got cut off. He ran out the timer. Because <laughs> you're going to do three minutes. Um, so that's how Kevin found out that he got cut off. So. Um, yeah, so I forgot that Kevin came out the J-Lit weekend. Um, Buff wrestled that weekend of J-Lit, and Buff was guest bartender at the thing for the after party. Hmm. And it was one of those things where I got there, I literally made like a high and a buy, and I talked to Kevin and his friend Casey and a couple other people just very briefly. But since I was traveling with my fellow old in Ultramantis, um, I make a reference to this on commentary, and Mantis and I are in commentary for one of the matches. Uh, where we just cuddle up in bed and watch Seinfeld reruns together. <laughs> because while everyone was getting wasted at the after party, that's what me and Mantis did <laughs> back at the hotel. But it was funny. And again, I rib Mantis to this day about it. Like, we get back to the hotel and, uh, like, we're getting all of our shit out. And he just, like, he just opens up the fanny pack and just, like, dumps all of his money on fucking bed. <laughs> and I go, what, are you going to sleep on it? you going to roll around on it? He goes, no, just get my money out. I'm going to count it. I go... Do it on, like, a desk. Why are you doing it on the bed? <laughs> but then he did that, and then, like, the two of us just sat there, and we stayed up watching Seinfeld. Yeah. Nice. Like, two olds. Um, yeah. But as for the stuff on the show, like, obviously stuff wasn't told to us, like, ahead of time, unless you were, like, part of an angle or something. But, like, we get there, and we see the sheets, and we're like, okay, they're going to do the bit with Robbie Ellis, and we're going to do the bit with this, we're going to do the bit with that. And then, like, you know, it was just one of those things where... Uh, I knew Tursus was back because he's my buddy. Um, I didn't know the Ducalion thing, but I knew there was something where, like, they were going to be getting this thing. And, oh, I don't know if I mentioned it before. So, like, okay, you said he kills Cobalt, right? Mm -hmm. So he kills Cobalt. Cobalt's dead. But we never say the guys are killed, okay? Yeah. You never hear us say that they're dead or whatever. It's just implied because – there might be a situation where, like, these characters might need to come back, like, years down the road, and this is just a way to write them out of storylines for the time being, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not like one of these things where it's like, oh, well, Cobalt's getting written out today, and then he's going to come back, like, ten months from now, or two years from now, or whatever it is. Like, most of this we found out, most of the people found out when they got there for the show, you know? Gotcha. <laughs> I look forward to like 20 years from now, Kevin telling the story of how he met me at a wrestling show. Yes. You know, that'll be just as impactful and as poignant to his, his history, you know, yes. <laughs> for sure. Uh, next call. Hi, Adam, Joe, strongest man on the land here. I'm not going to, you know, name names or do anything bad or, you know, but basically there was somebody who ran a show and um, long story short, it didn't go well. Really didn't draw in a lot of people. And the person running this goes on a rant about how no one supported him, no one shared his flyers, and like a whole bunch of other excuses. And he just had a whole pity party, claiming he had to you know, use his rent money to pay people. And from my research, it seems like this guy has absolutely no ties to wrestling at all. Like, at all. I think he was just a fan. A fan who wanted to make his own promotion, thinking it'd be a good, good idea. Obviously, you guys aren't really promoters, and, you know, I know, Joe, you've been involved with wrestling for a, a fairly long time now. So, uh, how about a nice discussion? If there's someone who has no idea what they're doing in wrestling, what are some advice 
some some advice I should say that you give them in creating a promotion and running it efficiently and you know doing well because um, it just seems like there's so many obvious things and this person just doesn't get it. That's that's really all I got. Nothing crazy this week. Just something to like, get a call in there. Hope you guys have a blessed one. I'm, I might have to go above Artie and ask the higher people up on the food chain of what the hell he's talking about, right? Yeah. I, I assume he's, uh, you know, sh- feeling the shared pain that we all have for that promoter in Tulsa, Oklahoma that ripped off Broski this week, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, <I'm> really. <laughs> but we've talked about this before, um, you know, and it's a joke, you know, that I'll, I'll take credit for saying, but I, you know, it's something that's still in my brain from Jim Cornette is how do you make a small fortune in wrestling? Start with a large one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and if you are uh, someone who's deciding to start uh, to run a brand new promotion, a brand new show with no affiliations to anyone else, uh, I will say to you, don't. Don't. But if you are 100% set on running this show, get together whatever the budget you think you can spend on that show, and cut it in half. Hmm. Now, with that, can you run this show successfully? Because when this show fails, and invariably it's going to fail, you are now going to have to double whatever you initially put down to run that show. Um, Obviously, if you are dead set, you need to have connections. You need to know people. Um, You know, obviously you need to be able to cut deals and make deals. And be involved with people that know what they're doing and make sure that you have a good support system around you. Because if you don't, you're going to get someone. And all it takes is one. You book the wrong person, the wrong ring person, the wrong building, the wrong venue, and they will just see you coming and bleed you dry. Um, Obviously, my whole thing is – and and so the other thing is – and Artie was nice enough not to say this person's name – Artie should absolutely slander this motherfucker everywhere that he can. Let it be a le- let Artie's foolishness be the lesson to other people never to work for this person again. And if this person decides to go away for six months, twelve months, two years, whatever the hell it is, and his name comes back up, keep that list. Write that person's name down so when you see his name associated with whatever that new promotion is, if you don't want to do it, Artie, I fucking will. I don't give a shit. I'll bury everyone. I don't give a fuck about nothing. I got nothing to lose. Artie's still out there trying to get booked. I don't want. I don't want to get booked. Hmm. Yeah, I have no idea who he's talking about. So you can tell me off air. You can tell me here. I don't care. Yeah, I don't know who it is. When I find out, uh, I'll I'll let you know. You know. Fair enough. Do you have any opinions on uh, running a wrestling show there, Adam? Uh, don't book me for commentary. There That's you the go. Smartest play you can do. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Sorry. Uh, uh, next call, sepia button. Oh. Hey, Joe. Adam, your sepia button holder, Big Sue here, checking in, making sure I keep that sepia button intact because we don't want Artie to get back in here and get it. Right. And hey, I made my re debut uh, in the city of Indianapolis after a three year absence. Got to get back out there and do the thing. And it went all right. Uh, I had a pretty good opponent. They got me through it, but I didn't necessarily feel like it was my best showing. You know, the ring rust was definitely showing. But that brings me to a question. What is your favorite re-debut of all time? And maybe one that you were really excited for, but didn't quite live up to everything that you were wanting it to be. Anyway, I hope you gents have a good week. Talk to you next time. Regards. Hmm. For a re-debut, does that have to be like a, a repackaging or just like a return from a, like a, a long layoff? What do you Let, think? Let's say a return from a layoff. 
Uh, I mean, honestly, and you're going to be mad at me. I'm going to say like Shawn Michaels coming back from the back injury. I, Shawn Michaels was my favorite wrestler of all time when I was a kid and like growing up as a young, young adult. He was my role model, Joe. <laughs> and uh, I never thought I'd see him wrestle again. I didn't realize that nobody stays retired in wrestling back then. And uh, when he came back and he had that street fight with Triple H, I was hooked, man. I was very invested in that match. So uh, that's like my all time like return from a long layoff you know so i don't know how long of a layoff you know we're talking like what constitutes that sort of thing um and obviously sue is mentioning about like a disappointment of a layoff you know somebody that i liked quite a bit Mm -hmm. and they came back and this might be controversial but like i said i say fuck it you know um nick gage uh you know nick gage had a real hot uh, 2021, you know, and even like years before that. And then after the match to Broski, and I can understand how that could crush anyone's soul. <laughs> um, not only being in the ring with Broski, but losing to him. Yeah. And having like probably the highest profile match of your career. I can imagine that's really a disappointment, but anyways, go on. Right. Wasn't that a week before he wrestled Chris Jericho on national television? Okay. Uh, I stand, I stand by it. Okay. <laughs> Um, so then Nikki takes some time off and then he comes back at the beginning of 2022 and he didn't look great, you know? Um, and you know, Nikki's a good dude, you know, and uh, I'm not going to say like we're best friends or anything, but we shared a lot of car rides together. We were on shows together. Um, he's a good dude and he didn't look to be in the best of shape when he came back in January and then wrestled one or two more times leading up to Mania weekend. And then he took some more time off as they were leading up to the match with him and Moxley. And then he has the match with Moxley and he didn't, he didn't look great in that one either. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and listen, it's tough out there when you wrestle that style and he, Nikki's been wrestling that style for like 23 years, maybe more, you know, if we count backyard day and stuff and Nikki's had a lot of problems. Nikki's had a lot of issues but uh, he ain't what he used to be, man. When he took that time off and he came back here at the beginning of 2022, um, yeah, I just, I just hope he's taking care of himself. You know, he he could uh, fuck wrestling. I say, you know, yeah. I mean, go get fat if you want to, as long as you're healthy. Yeah, you know, you could be, you could, you could be fat and healthy. You know, <laughs> so uh, uh, whatever makes him happy that isn't bad for him. You know. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Next call. Hi, guys. Kevin here. God, can you believe we are just one week away from Joe doing everything in his power to avoid me for two days? Oh, <laughs> gosh, we're almost there. Almost there, my favorite time of year. Uh, so I'm sitting here with my kid. We're about to watch uh, Justice League, and then tomorrow morning we're going to watch Zack Snyder's Justice League. And the reason why is I never watched either of them. Um, I know, I know, with me being a big comic fan and everything, I was just very turned off with a lot of stuff uh, going on in D.C. and a lot of stuff Zack Snyder was doing. But time, time I sat down and watched these. And everyone says the Snyder verse version, or the Zack Snyder version is better than Joss Whedon version in the extended time run and everything. Uh, so my question is, if you could pick one wrestling event that would be longer than the version that currently exists, what wrestling event would it be and why? Uh, sub question or sub point, Adam, I understand if your choice is that brief moment of joy that you had this past Monday. I totally understand <laughs> if you wish that lasted longer. So, anyways, looking forward to listening to the show, guys. Talk to you later and see you soon. Ah, uh, yeah, I've already got into great detail about how that should have been a much longer segment. Uh, um, but before we get to the question that he says there, I, I've never seen this, the Zack Snyder Justice League because it took me three years or so to see the original. And I was like, OK, that that's enough. I don't need to see more of it. You ever yeah, I, it? I saw the original in theaters opening weekend and I didn't like it, um, you know, but I knew everything about it going into it. Of course, you know, I do a comic book podcast, so I'm yeah. well aware of what's going on with stuff like that. It was pretty well publicized. And I heard the Zack Snyder one is really good. But, like, that's way too fucking long, man, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to sit through that. And the only thing I liked out of that entire movie was uh, uh, Dungeons & Dragons Joe as Deathstroke. 
Okay. And, like, because I'm a Deathstroke mark, and I was like, okay, that is a cool casting for that, and then nothing ever came of it, so I'm bitter, you know? Mm-hmm. But, uh, I don't know, a uh, show you wish was longer, Joe, I guess was the question. None. Every show should be shorter. Um, I'm the guy who says whenever I see the match times on the sheets for the LBAC shows, I'm like, two minutes should be taken off every single one of these matches. Listen, I like wrestling, but you need a break in any sort of, you know, any sort of media that you're consuming. Uh, you know, I listen to a bunch of podcasts. I need to take a break and read some comic books. I read like four or five comic books. OK, let me go watch something else. Like if you just overload yourself with any one particular type of entertainment, you're going to get sick of it. And I think this, and I'll attribute this joke to Colt Cabana, because I thought it was funny at the time, because he comes across as asexual to me. (laughs) Um, It was when Raw made the official move to be three hours all the time. Uh. And he had said, like, yeah, Raw may be good, but even sex for three hours straight is going to get tiring after a while, you know? (laughs) And I thought that was funny, because I assume Colt Cabana is a virgin. (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense. That lines up. Um, I will say, as a fan who just goes to the shows now just to have fun and watch and drink, I wish LVAC shows were maybe one match longer. They don't have to be 20-minute barn burners. You know, keep them under six minutes. That's fine. But give me one more match. You know, three before intermission, maybe three after intermission. Uh, But that's just me being uh, a nitpicky person. I think uh, a lot of the wrestling I watch is the right amount of time or too long. But I agree with you for the most part. I I assumed you were going to say the uh, Wheeler Yuta Daniel Garcia marathon match should have been longer. God. Should have been been longer and hotter. Yeah. You know what? If that was an air conditioner, air conditioned building (laughs) or it wasn't like 150 degrees in there. Uh, then I probably would say, yeah, add more time to it, even though it was a so-so match. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, it's the greatest match in the history of independent wrestling. No, it was two good half-hour matches. But anyways. And I look forward to seeing Kevin and uh, the uh, Maddie. Tr- uh, Maddie Tree, who's going? Is the, uh, Maddie's going with them, I think? Yeah, yeah Maddie Tree, it's because the educator doesn't leave the house because he's never beat anybody. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to seeing Kevin. You know, hopefully we're in the same section together or very close enough, you know, that we can hunt each other down. Um, yeah, it's, we're going to be there for two days, you know. We're going to eventually see each other at some point. Yeah. Uh, next call, ping button time. Hey, Joe and Adam, it's Ed. Um, so, Dynamite last night, I stayed awake uh, to watch... Ethan Page versus Eddie Kingston, one of the best feuds ever. Um, and Ethan Page won. And I woke up this morning, uh, and people on Twitter were saying they'd never watch AEW again because of it, and how mad they are that Eddie Kingston didn't win. And for, like, AEW fans being the fans that are like, no, this company tells stories. They sure just don't fucking get the story with Eddie Kingston, do they? But, like... He's going to lose until he wins the big one, and then that's a big moment. And that's the story of, of Eddie Kingston. It's, uh, it's a lot like, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure Adam is aware of this, because it's Japanese wrestling. It's like Hiroki Goto, where like, Goto well, doesn't win the big one. That's Goto's story. Like, and it has been, like Goto's whole career. I don't know, man. Like, I think these things are getting worse. Um, also, like, people hate Ethan Page and think he's bad, and I don't get that, because... He fucking checks every box he would want for a top. It's very weird. It's all very weird. I think some people on Twitter might be little babies. <laughs> mm. it's, like, how do you look at Ethan Page? You're like, no, he's no, he's actually bad. The 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 very tall uh, man that wrestles well and, and can talk really well on the mic. He's actually bad. <laughs> it's fucking insane. <laughs> So, uh, hopefully you guys have heard our episode by now. I had, uh, I had the flu, <laughs> and I'm still at work, and when I got here, they were like, yo, have you guys, or, uh, have you, have, have you gotten the paint that you needed for your job? And I said, no, and they're like, okay, then you're gonna run classes today, which is my old job that I fucking hate, and I forgot what it's like to, like, go into work and hate everything for ten hours. Not fun. So I just wondered, what's your guys' least favorite job you've ever had? Uh, just, like, real shit, because this is mine. Unloading rubber presses like that are 400 fucking degrees while you have the flu. That's my fucking least favorite job. 
This shit sucks. Um, it's not confidence, it's all ego. Bye! First of all, I, of course, I've been drawing comparisons to Goto all week with uh, Eddie Kingston, but uh, right. I didn't want to bring it up. Uh, and as far as Ethan Page just being this great dude, I don't know. I've seen his Twitter re- recently. <laughs> Not looking good. Oh, boy. Um, so, Ed, this is one of – and you could count on one hand and still have enough fingers left over to take the pickles off your hot dog. Um, with this one, that you are in the right in regards to both people getting worked, um, and I think that's a testament to how invested people get into the character of Eddie Kingston, that they think it's real. It's like when I got invested in the Raven Punk thing in 2003 Ring of Honor. Um, listen, wrestling's fake. It's all This is all a shouts field, whatever, but it's Raven, and I didn't like CM Punk, and all my friends like CM Punk, and like Raven was my favorite. And I'm like, fuck, they, fuck this guy. And that was like the, the beginning of the rivalry that became a shoot. And then he got a year off. And then now he's a piece of shit again doing MMA commentary uh, and looking like he's about two cycles off of a uh, Dr. Zahorian diet on TV. Hmm. Uh, but um, I think so. A lot of our mutuals, Ed, and I'm talking to Ed, don't like Ethan Page because there was a period of time when Ethan Page was in Evolve. He was a big vanity searcher, right? Mm. Um, And I think that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And listen, everyone's going to do social media the way they do social media. And I definitely think that rubbed people uh, the wrong way. And if they take their blinders off and listen, I could look at someone uh, critically, I'd like to think, someone who I'm friends with. Um, I liked Ethan Page's stuff before I knew him and then saw his stuff coming up through AIW into Evolve, the little brief stink that he had in Ring of Honor that was like a cup of coffee, Uh uh-huh. But uh, I've always been a fan of his. You know, I get it. Um, He's not like the flashy, flippy-do guy like an AR Fox or something. Uh, He's not like a Janela who has like that uh, uh, intangible whatever. Um, But I've said on this show before that I think like Ethan Page is like MJF done right, you know? Um... Mm -hmm. Uh, one can only hope that in like nine years that MJF is what Ethan Page is today, if any of that makes any sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's all. But, you know, I'm biased. I admit I'm biased when it comes to certain people. And yeah, uh, his 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 Twitter got hacked. That sucks today. <laughs> Ethan Page was nice to me the time I met him, so he gets a pass, too. Yeah, for sure. But All right. Last call. Ed called back again. Oh, Hey, Joe and Adam, this is Ed. Hopefully you can hear me because I'm not I'm calling from a different place than I normally call from. I'm so fucking pissed right now. I'm so fucking mad. They got pissed off Taker. Twitter got pissed off Taker. Our friend Mark doesn't have a Twitter anymore. Elon Musk is Mr. Brown. Elon Musk has been shooting in uh, Mark's <laughs> pants this entire time. I fucking hate it here. I hate everything. Mother fuck. This app is way less fun. I fucking hate it. Just like I said on the show, it's not going to be relevant in two years. I fucking hate it. I hate this place. Yeah, just before we went live. Why have to be March? Oh, <laughs> he's still there. <laughs> all right. Um, I I I think we all knew. Uh, Mark, our good friend, the Undertaker, was going to get <laughs> popped with everything that was going on on Twitter. Like people were getting popped for much less. Like that Tom's custom guy got popped for making fake gifts, uh, fake images of wrestling matches that were happening. You know. Yeah. Um, I know as we record, like it was one of those things where, like, I was eating my dinner and I saw everything going down with uh, Taker, and I called and I left a message on Pod Van Dam, and as I'm typing a message to someone else, they messaged me and say, "I just left a scathing voicemail on Pod Van Dam about this Taker stuff," <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "Me too!" And uh, it's that's gonna that's the one thing that's gonna unite a lot of people. Um, you know, when they came for the Tom's customs, I said nothing. And when they came for the porn bots, I said nothing. They actually didn't come for the porn bots. I've noticed that you don't know have noticed. So like fun playing around accounts are getting popped. Uh-huh. Um, there's a, there's an account of a guy who's like just doing a fake Eric Bischoff thing where he's talking about like, ter- like Hulk Hogan forcing him to blow him. Right. <laughs> But he's, like, plugging Eric Bischoff's book. Like, he just made his profile look, and I think, like, the I in Bischoff is an L, right? Uh-huh. 
no problems there because he paid the eight bucks so he could do whatever he wants on Twitter, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's like one of those things where it's like, oh, they came for the Tom's Customs and I didn't do anything and they came for the Taker and I didn't do anything and then it was too late and they came for me, you know? Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I started, um, what the hell is the one that I, I, I signed up for one? Uh, I forget what the hell it is. Mastodon? Um, O-Host? What was it? O-Host, it's called. Never heard of it. Yeah, because Mastodon, like, you have to, like, assign yourself to a server, and nobody's on any one given. Like, everybody's on, like, 17 different servers, so, like, I gotta figure out, like, where the most people are gonna end up there. But I- I'll I'll be here until they throw me off Twitter, man. You know? I, until they, they shutter it, and as we're recording this, like, people are like, yeah, it's gonna be closed tomorrow. We're not going to have a Twitter to come back to on Friday, you know, (laughs) and uh, I don't think it's going to happen that quickly. Um, But there is a mass exodus. There's been a mass exodus for like the last like week over this. And, uh, you know, I'll be sitting here as Twitter crumbles around me, eating an apple and just saying, like, where did everybody go? You know? (laughs) Yeah, uh, I will say uh, I am enjoying watching all of the accounts that are faking being celebrities and like corporations and stuff yeah. uh, and are just causing chaos because that's going to eventually cost uh, Twitter and Musk advertising. You know, mm-hmm. like when like, you know, a fake General Motors account comes out and says something shitty and it gets 50,000 likes and then General Motors goes to to fucking Twitter and being like, yo, you need to shut this shit down. I think that's funny. Um, it sucks that like harmless accounts that are following the rules of putting parody in their name and in their bio are still getting shut down while fucking hate speech and shit that gets reported literally left and right just goes unchecked. Uh, like fuck all that. Uh, but with that being said, like I'm not shutting down my Twitter because that's your only way you're going to see or hear from me. Because if Twitter goes away, uh, you guys, uh, will never hear from me again. Uh, cause the podcast goes away. If Twitter goes away, that's the rule. Um, but as far as Mastodon goes, uh, I, I saw a lot of people having like problems getting their confirmation email. I did make it. I made two attempts to get Mastodon. So, because everybody is like, oh, Mastodon's where you go, whatever. So I downloaded it. And like you said, it first question it asks you is like, here's all the servers, pick one. And I got confused by technology and I'm old and I'm scared. So I deleted the app. And then I was like, that's it. And then I saw online that the server doesn't matter. Uh, that's just kind of where your tweets or whatever, for lack of better serve, uh, are saved. And everybody, regardless of their server, still shows up in your feed, just like Twitter. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to go and sign up again. So I get the app. I just randomly pick a server, no problem. I get my at the man Adam Van username. And then it says, okay, we're going to send you a confirmation email. Click the link in that. And it'll take, you know, 15, 20 minutes for you to get the email. It took three days for me to get the email, Joe. So three days later, I get the email. I click on it. It says, okay, your account has been verified. Please sign in again. Uh, I go to sign in. It says your password is wrong. I'm like, all right. I, it's going to be – my password is either this or this. So I'm like, all right. I use this. Let me try this. It says your password is wrong. I'm like, okay, it's not fucking wrong. It's one of these two. Uh, so I'm like, all right. Well, I'll click the link that says – forgot password and i clicked that and joe it's been over a week i haven't received the reset password email (laughs) so i'm like all right i'm out i'm done twitter goes away you'll never hear from me again (laughs) i'm not doing anything oh boy uh, but at the man out of van at mastodon is gone so none of you fuckers can have it (laughs) you know it's taken (laughs) it's just nobody knows what the password is apparently right yeah well that sucks yeah so good luck anybody go Setting up for that, you know. Yeah. Anyways. Anyways. Fuck, fuck Twitter. Uh, yeah, listen, fuck social media in general. Um, you know, fuck Twitter. Good luck. Um, if you're sticking around, welcome. If you're, you know, leaving, don't make a big deal out of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just just let us know where you're going and we'll make the decision uh, where to follow you. I see a lot of people going to Discord, but then, like, you have all these different Discord servers that are all disparate and spread out all over the place, you know? 
Yeah, no, fuck that. I was like, I don't pay attention to discords. I'm man, I'm not joining any other ones. <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I've seen one or two. Uh, I've seen a bunch of them pop up. I sent requests to have myself added to like one, maybe two of them, but I haven't like peeked in them yet because I'm just not a Discord guy, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just, uh, I'm gonna get Ed my phone number and he could just text me his random thoughts. That's, that's what I do. Yeah, I, want I have Ed's. Phone. You want Ed's? Here, do you want Ed's phone number? Hang on. Yeah, just read it on the air. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, is five. Nope, I better stop. Remember when I used to? Who was it? Who's was it? Ed's phone number that I was going to read on the air. Uh, a, num- a, a number a week. Yeah, and then you were like, "Oh, you gave the first number, and then you immediately admitted it was a lie, so you killed the bit." Okay. <laughs> yeah. You also uh, uh, there was an email address. Uh, Jason Kirk, you're giving out his email. Oh, yeah, that was a while. Oh, my God, that was like forever ago. (laughs) All right, so here's what I'll tell you about Ed's phone number, okay? Uh There's there's no ones, there's no eights, and there's no nines. Jeez, how do you make a number then? (laughs) uh, that's, That's as much as I can give you. All right, fair enough. So, hey, listen, support the show. Um, you know, use uh, promo code at odds, sign it up for Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium, aka independent wrestling TV. Uh, new subscribers gonna tell Jerry that you came to him from us, and we'll get a little bit of a kickback as Jerry attempts to reestablish everything over at IWTV as Fight TV Plus uh, is making headways, and they have, I think, 17 shows this weekend all running head-to-head against each other, which was the problem or the reason they all left Jerry's thing, but whatever. Good luck to everybody with their shows this weekend. <laughs> um, you could also make any and all of your purchases through our Amazon affiliate link. Uh, the link to that is in the show notes to every single one of these episodes, no matter where it is that you get these episodes. Uh, it does not cost you anything extra. They, Amazon, call it an advertising fee. I call it thing that makes Adam happy at the end of the month when he gets his cut of the fucking money. Yeah. And then Adam has the uh, podcasts to run through, huh? I do have the podcasts to run through. And those podcasts that you should also run through are Longbox Heroes, Longbox Heroes After Dark, Final Wrestling Place, We Need Music. God damn it! Every fucking time! (laughs) We Need Wrestling! Hit my music. You know what I'm going to... My problem is, Hit My Music is on the list right next to We Need Wrestling. I'm cutting and pasting it. And I'm putting it at the very end, so they're nowhere close to each other, so there's no way that my eyes can possibly read the two of them. And we need wrestling, porch talk, viewer's choice, WWE war, wrestling cheers, indie wrestling guide, pod van dam, the A show, wings on wings, uh, between the sheets, if you catch my grift, and now at the very bottom of the list, only because it keeps messing me up, hit my music. God damn it. (laughs) And, uh, hey, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Um, I'll be making a rare uh, podcast appearance here in the next couple days on another show. Oh. Uh, I'm not going to say which one yet because I want it to be a surprise to some people. Of course, it'll be at soon to be named network.com, of course, because I'm going to you know, promote myself. Uh, but some could say me being on this podcast might be breaking news. All right. I'm sure somebody gets that. Well, it takes uh- one person. All right, and Joe, if you're on a trivia show, just do me a favor. Give me, like, a day to listen to the episode before you spoil the results. That's all I have. All right. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll do the uh, opportunity where it's on Skype. So yeah. I just pull the audio myself before the podcast itself goes live. Because usually when I'm on Five Star Match Game, like, from the time that we record to the time the episode comes out, it's, like, a week sometimes. Uh-huh. So if I'm ever on Five Star Match Game again... Uh, I'll just send you the raw audio. Excellent. All right, cool. Works for me. Yeah. Joe, it's time to play my favorite jingle. You will not deprive me of it again. Absolutely not. Some might cost a little. Some might cost a lot. And your figures will be bought. (laughs) 
All right, Joe. I'm sure you have a lot of things, so I'll just let you get right into it. Uh, I got none. What? You are not pulling your weight in this segment. You know, no, listen, it, it, listen, it's a lot of weight, but I'm definitely not pulling it. You know, <laughs> you're like me in this day in history. You know, come oh, on. Oh, there you go. But uh, all right, Joe, uh, I have a couple things, uh, but you'll be surprised. There's not a lot either. Um, I purchased I actually saw on Facebook. Yes, I'm, I'm still on Facebook. Uh, our local toy store, Monstars, bought a collection of wrestling figures from somebody. And it wasn't a huge collection, but there was a lot of basics in there. And it was a lot of girl basics, women's basics. Uh, and there was an Alexa Bliss rookie fig, uh, which I already have. But I was like, oh, I'm going to go down to the toy store and see what they have them priced at. And it was only 15 bucks, and it was mint. So you can never have too many Alexa Bliss rookie figs, Joe. That's my opinion. I guess. A Lucy, huh? No, no. It was on card. Oh, okay. I I thought it was was a bunch of Lucy's. No, no, no. It was just a bunch of, like, female WWE basics. And I actually tweeted out a picture because they had the the Renee Young that I had just bought on eBay a couple weeks ago. They had that. Oh, yes, yes, I remember. Uh, they had uh, the first Stephanie McMahon figure, like the first time in line. I was going to buy that for, for Todd, but uh, uh, there's a bunch of them. But uh, they actually had also the AJ Lee Elite rookie fig, but it was priced too high. So I was like, no, thank you. I don't need that. But uh, for f- 15 bucks, I'll buy an Alexa figure if I already have it. No big deal. So I bought that. And then just earlier today, it came to my attention that once again, Amazon had in stock for retail price, the Elite 97 Chainsaw Charlie figure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey. So, uh, again, I do no, I do not pay the suckers premium uh, buying figs from ringside anymore. Uh, not until they drop down to retail or lower. Uh, so, yes, I did not get the Chainsaw Charlie when all of our friends did like a month ago, but I got, um, I got it now or I will have it in a day or two. Uh, and I paid 22 bucks for it. So, yay. Let's see what sort of shape that comes in on the packaging. huh? If it comes in bad shape, I order a replacement. And if that one comes in bad shape, I order another replacement. And we do that dance, Joe. <laughs> or you could pay the suckers premium and get one shipped in a fig defender and not have to worry about this dance. But why should I have to pay an extra five dollars for the defender and an extra six dollars for the figure, and then when ringside goes and sends me a crushed one inside of a defender, uh, I still have to do this. All right. And if I, I have to order a replacement from Amazon, uh, I click a little button. They ship me a new one right away. I get that within twenty four hours, and then at my leisure, I can take the the, the damaged one back to Kohl's. As opposed to ringside, I have to get an RMA order. I have to mail the one back to New York, wait for them to process it, and then they ship me another one. All right. Fair enough. I'm trying to support the little businesses. You, uh... Oh, yeah, the little mom-and-pop organization ringside. Let's, yeah. let's play a fiddle for them. <laughs> God. I'm just glad you're buying Terry Funk action figures, yes, okay? Yes, and I, I am actively in the market for his... Uh, WWE Elite figure based on the ECW world title run. None of them pop up in the, the major group. I'm pissed. I have it. I have it. Um, I know you have it. So does Brett and DJ. I don't have it, though. Yeah. I need that. I need a mint on card one. It's the only one I want. I uh, There's, there's I, 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 because an older one, like the sticker on it is a little suspect. Okay. Where there's a sticker on it that says, like, includes branding iron and ECW title. Yeah. Like, that sticker could be in a little bit better shape, but I'll, the box is in really good shape, you know? Yeah, nice. And I add that to my LJN that I'm still looking for the Brandon Iron on. My uh, right. my Terry Funk collection has gone from zero to two within the last couple of months. You know? The influence is strong, what can I tell you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Joe, actually, my Terry Funk collection is about to go to three starting tomorrow. Oh, that's right. Yes, I'm making that purchase as well. Yeah. So I'll just say before we get into that, uh, that's it for weekly purchases for me. Those two figs. Mm. Well, like I said, we'll talk about the other thing next week when we all hopefully get it, right? Yeah, I know we'll go into greater detail of as far as our experience, but uh, uh, I, I'm debating. Like, I don't know what the 
in stock situation is going to be with this? Like, is this going to be a no holds barred thing where everybody who tries isn't guaranteed one? Or is it going to be something like the, you know, the Cody ultimate that, you know, was just available for a week? Like, should I buy two of these? Or like, I don't know. That's a, that's a, I think that's a good question because obviously uh, everybody in our circle wants one, at least one. I know, uh, I know uh, DJ's buying two sets so you can have a Lucy uh, Terry Funk. So I don't know. What do you think? So I think it's going to be somewhere in between. It's not going to be the mad rush like the No Holds Barred set was. I think that's something that people have just been waiting for for a very long time. Okay. But I don't think it's going to be a two-week pre-order. I definitely think there's going to be a window on this set, but I don't think it's going to be like the mad rush like the Zeus Hogan one was. You know, no offense. Listen. Terry Funk is a big deal in our circles, not as much as like pop culture circles, like general yeah. pop culture circles. Um, I'm getting one, and you know, depending on how the packaging comes, like I've seen the packaging. You know, Hawkins and Broski have talked about the way that they're packaging, but you know, I might be looking to unload the Hogan. I don't, you know, I don't need a Hogan figure. I need a Terry Funk figure. The Hogan is uh in the way, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think you'll have a tro- problem unloading that Hogan because, like you said. You know, I think more of the general public is looking for the Hogan and trying to unload a a, a funk, you know? So, right. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just buy one. I'll have to see what the shipping looks like. If it's something like $10 ship or shipping for one and $10 for two, I can somehow do the mental gymnastics that like, oh, well, it's only $5 each if I get two of them, you know? Yeah. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, tomorrow at noon? Noon Eastern, yes. Yeah. Uh if you and again, you know, and listen, we're talking about it. We're gonna you're gonna talk about it again next week when it comes out. Yeah. Um, but it's creations.mattel.com. Um, if you search the Coliseum collection figures, um, even if you just go to the site and sign up for their email list, you'll get that reminder when the figure rolls out. Um, yeah, but uh, I'm looking forward to it, you know? Yeah. Uh I love I love me some Terry Vonk. Yeah, and it's it's an ultimate, and I like this Coliseum line. So uh, we'll see what the next one's in there. I have the uh, the, the the Sergeant Slaughter that was kind of like the predecessor to this, the same type of packaging, you know. So it says limit two per customer on the website. Yeah. I got I I gotta get two, right? Yeah, I got. Yeah, you you have to get two. Did you? Uh, I don't know if you saw here as I'm zo- zooming around on the Hogan, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're seeing like all the different Mattel people in the crowd. Uh huh. If you look right between Hogan's leg, there's a guy getting the Kona Crush. Uh huh. You see who that is? Can you tell who that is for my thing? Is that Bill McKenna? It's Bill McKenna. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny. Yeah, but yeah, they're beautiful. Like that, that funk's really nice, and that's, I need an ECW funk to go with that. So yeah, yeah. Anybody's, but... anybody's holding? Let me know. <laughs> but. Joe, that's it. Like I said, it's a it's a very light weekly purchases for me. Uh, it truly is the year of financial responsibility. And Finally, it, yeah, and it has nothing to do with the fact that I bought two prototypes last week, and I'm trying to uh, trying to like limit things. But yeah. uh, I will say, uh, other than that, uh, it's been a relatively pleasant week. But something pissed me off, Joe. All heat, no heat. I, I didn't think we'd be having something like this this week. You know, I figured your confrontation with a geezer uh, at the uh, Shenandoah Family Dollar this past week was enough. <laughs> but what else happened? I like how the location changes every time. Uh, I will say, obviously, like I just mentioned, uh, I made some big purchases last week, some big boy purchases. I still don't have one of them, but it is in New Jersey. God help it. I wouldn't want to be in New Jersey if I was that figure, but eventually it'll be here. Uh, So I did make a conscious effort over the past week to have some restraint and to not do any uh, frivolous spending. So other than like you know, $50, $60 worth of Funko Pops that I didn't bring up during weekly purchases. I've been pretty good. Uh, But during that time, uh, and during every time, I try to stay uh, up to date, try to watch what happens 
in a friend of ours business venture. And that friend is Ronald Two Legs, Pat from Pod Van Dam. Okay. And one of the things that he does on Facebook is he does card breaks. You know, you basically buy into the break. You know, you'll basically say, okay, here's all the teams that are in the NFL. Uh, If you'd like to purchase the Steelers or purchase the 49ers, it costs X amount. And then when you buy that, that team, he goes and opens up the packs on Facebook Live. And whatever players are on that team, you get the cards of. Familiar with the concept, I'm sure, right? Yes. So, uh, Pat, as always, whenever he has football, he'll tag me in it. And uh, I've said to him, well, I don't want any of the 2021 uh, breaks. Let me know when you're going to run 2022 cards because I want to roll the dice and try to get a Kenny Pickett rookie card. And Kenny Pickett is the new quarterback for the Steelers. Uh, Ben Roethlisberger just ended a Hall of Fame worthy first ballot Hall of Fame career. Uh, and this is the first time I'm having a new quarterback, so I need to get a Kenny Pickett rookie card. So he's like, no problem. I'm going to be running a 2022 set uh, in a couple days. And then I buy all of those prototypes, and I'm dead broke. And then Pat <laughs> goes and tags me. He says, hey, 2022s, here you go. Uh, I'm like, god damn it. Fucking <laughs> bad timing. So, Joe, do you want to take a guess at what it cost to buy the Steelers in his uh, break that he had the other day. Uh, what's the price? Uh, so I'm going to say it's probably not the top tier, but not the bottom tier. I'm going to say that it's like in the middle third tier of like however much these prices are. Um, so it does fluctuate from year to year because like if he's ripping open a box that has like, for example, 2021, <laughs> had like the Joe Burrow rookie card in it, which is big amongst those, those Ohio people and uh, you know, some other players, but like last year there weren't any marquee Steelers on the, in the sets. So the Steelers were cheap in 2021, but obviously in 2022, Kenny Pickett is the highest drafted quarterback. So the Steelers were a more expensive team. So I think they were the second or third most expensive uh, team you could buy in that rip that he was doing. Okay. But just so you don't even have to guess, it was eighty-five bucks to buy the Steelers. Okay. And so um, I, I guess I guess my question would be is like, okay, so if Steelers are eighty-five bucks on the twenty twenty-two, like what's the high end on the twenty twenty-two? Maybe ninety, a hundred. Okay, so the Steelers are actually toward the top of the list. Exactly, because people want that Kenny Pickett. You know, that's one of the better cards you can pull. Gotcha. Um, and like the cheaper ones are like maybe fifty, if that makes sense. Um. So I'm like, God. Damn it. Like this timing is terrible. Uh, I actually brought it up to Todd on an episode of porch talk two weeks ago. Uh, and I was like, I, is the Steelers still available? Okay. They're still available. And I waited and I waited and I'm like, I'm going to end up buying this, this spot and this, this thing. Cause I, I have to, right. I'm, I'm kind of obligated. I told Pat that I would, uh, he goes and tags me in it. It's there. But I'm like, oh, this is terrible timing. I'm like, please, please let somebody claim that Steelers spot. So I, I could be like, oh, man, I wanted to get to it, but somebody beat me to it. You know, like it was one of those things. Uh, so I was at, at, at the uh, the Roker podcasting compound doing porch talk. And I was like, all right, if I get home and it's still there, I'm going to claim the spot. I have no business doing it. I don't have the money for it, but I'm going to claim the spot. So I go home. And Joe, somebody claimed it. I'm like, thank God. This is the best thing that could possibly happen. And I don't have to worry about spending the 85 bucks. Uh, because, Joe, what are the fucking chances that a Kenny Pickett card is going to come out of that? You know? I would so, say slim to none. Slim to none. Because these packs only have like six cards per pack. And the box that he was ripping had, I want to say, six packs. So whatever six times th- six is, 36 cards. Could be, you know? right. Six times six could be any number, right? Exactly. It could be any number. Who's to yeah. say? The, the science isn't back yet on that, you know? Uh, so somebody claimed the spot, and I'm happy that I don't have to spend the money, and it's all good. So a couple days later, uh, Pat messages me. He's like, N- uh, not feeling the, the the football rips. And I'm like, oh, man, I you know, money, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to get in on one, but like, I, it's just bad timing. And he's like, oh, you got to see what we pulled in the, the rip the other day. Oh, boy. And Joe, a Kenny Pickett rookie card was pulled. Okay. 
a fucking autographed rookie card. <laughs> An autographed rookie card that's like a $400 card. And I could have had it if I wasn't a goddamn cheapskate. From this point forward, Joe, I'm buying everything. <laughs> the year of financial responsibility is fraudulent. It doesn't exist. I'm never mentioning those words again in the year 2022. It's bullshit. <laughs> I fucked myself out of a Kenny Pickett autographed rookie card. And I, oh, I'm so mad. It's all your fault for trying to get me to stop spending money. My fault? Yes, your fault. Uh, and and uh, just remind me again what were I can I I'm gonna unfavorite the uh, tweet with the financial responsibility for 2022. By the way, <laughs> I'll wait for the new one to come up. You know. <laughs> oh man, I was so mad. I was like, why did you show me this? What? So what? What were the prototypes? Remind everyone again. What were the prototypes that you bought instead of this? Uh, oh, don't get Wilson oh, me, Wilson Pickett figure. Before you even go down that road, if I had to choose. Between the uh, the uh, Azrael prototype figures and a Kenny Pickett rookie card, I'll take the Azrael's every day of the week. Okay. Because I next week, next month, next year, next decade, I can still buy that Kenny Pickett card. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't a one of one. You know, it was like a one of like 200 or something like that, but it, it doesn't matter. I can always get another Kenny Pickett card, but those Azrael's are, are irreplaceable. Uh, but, uh, yes, I understand why you're going to be like, yeah, you should have passed an Asriel. No, where were you fucking 10 years ago? And you should have said, pass on the goddamn daredevil comic book and buy the Aaron judge card. That's when you would have been useful. Uh, but this Asriel stuff, no, I'd still take the Asriel every day. <laughs> well, yeah. again, let that be a lesson to you. Yeah. Um, contribute to, uh, every one of Pat's, uh, card breaks from here on out. <laughs> Yeah, he does have another one going, but he raised the price of the fucking Steelers. Oh, my goodness. Raised it up to 120. Uh, so, I don't know. I think he's just trolling me at this point. So, uh, I'm going to need everybody to go and send me. Uh, I'm going to start a GoFundMe to, to get into Pat's uh, card breaks. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but that's all I have, Joe. Missed opportunity is why I was mad this week. Next time. You'll get it next time, I next promise. Time. Yeah. All right. Nice short show. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for listening. This was episode 215 of At Odds with Wrestling. Uh, for Adam, this is Joe saying be safe out there and enjoy some wrestling. You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Networks.